Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking your virtual seats. We are going to give everyone a few minutes to trickle in and very, very excited to welcome you to the F Factor. Seeing our numbers climbing, which is amazing. Thank you everyone for joining us. We will get started in just one moment. Such an exciting day, the first day of International Women's Week. We'll give everyone one more minute as we have people trickling in. Looking forward to a great audience today. All right, as people continue to take their virtual seats, I think we are going to get started. So we will pull our cover screen down. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. My name is Sonia Shori. I have the privilege of serving as the Vice President Strategy, Marketing and Communications for Invest Ottawa, Lead Economic Development Agency for Knowledge-Based Industries here in our region and Bayview Yards, Ottawa's one-stop business acceleration shop. It is such a pleasure to welcome you to the official launch of the third annual International Women's Week and the F Factor, our launch event, Fueling Women Founders. Invest Auto and Bayview Yards are honored to join our partners, Elspark and MDK Business Law this year and welcome entrepreneurs, investors, thought leaders and partners from our region through Canada and around the world to our virtual launch event today. Before we begin our special program, it is my pleasure to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Rita Alma, our new diversity and belonging lead and strategist for Invest Ottawa and Bayview Yards, who will deliver our land acknowledgement for today. Thank you so much, Rita, for being with us. Thanks so much, Sonia. Hi, everybody. As we're coming together today for the purpose of building and supporting women's leadership and entrepreneurship, it's important to approach this project with meaning and intention. This is why I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our work and the organization's presence on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Unceded means that these lands, which we now call Ottawa, were never signed away by the Anishinaabe people who inhabited them before European settlers arrived in North America. In other words, this land was stolen. I'm raising this as part of a personal commitment to truth and reconciliation, knowing that the first step is to admit the truth and that Indigenous leaders have been calling on non-Indigenous voices to help do so. The truth also means acknowledging the ways in which colonization and its effects are gendered, which is relevant to our event here today, as evidenced by the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women in this country, for example. Second, we acknowledge that the Algonquin Anishinaabe people are still here. Part of the intentions and effects of colonization are to erase the existence of Indigenous peoples, and we do this land acknowledgement to counter that force of erasure. Lastly, I'd like to call attention to another of colonization's effects, the intentional separation and marginalization of Indigenous people, which has meant that most settlers have little to no connections to Indigenous communities and knowledges. Being systematically separated from a whole group of people and a critical body of knowledge, especially in the time of climate emergency, is and continues to be a huge loss and poses a growing risk to our collective future. I'd love to ask us now to take a minute to scan your personal and professional circles. Ask yourself, who's missing? And how can I build meaningful connections with Indigenous people close to me and take just one action in the next week to reverse the damage and separation that colonization has caused? Let's take a moment of silence here.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita, for being such an important part of our journey. We're honored to have you as a member of our team and our community. And International Women's Week truly is all about community. We were reflecting as we came onto the call today about how so many of us were gathered together at Bayview Yards one year ago before the pandemic was a reality, exchanging hugs, kind words, support, and demonstrating commitment to a cause that we all believe in. We know that Ottawa, Canada's capital, is a global tech hub. It is also a resilient hub as we join so many resilient hubs right across the country and around the world. Our region is founded on diverse top talent and our region is committed to inspiring, equipping and empowering women leaders in every professional field from entrepreneurship and innovation to our main street, technology industry, academia, government, media and nonprofits. And over the next 12 days, we will bring all of these strengths to bear together as a community for our community and it is a global community. We are honored to collaborate with so many near and far who are committed to driving progress on our shared goals. We have more than 39 events because there are several in the queue that our team is racing to get online, more than 50 partners, hundreds of participants currently registered, and we hope at the end we'll, there will be thousands. Our goal is to maximize our collective impact on current and aspiring women leaders from every walk of life here and at home and around the world. Throughout this virtual International Women's Week, we're joining forces with friends and colleagues across Ontario, from Kingston to Toronto, Waterloo Region and Windsor, from coast to coast, from St. John's, Newfoundland to Vancouver, BC, throughout the United States, from the Eastern Seaboard in Boston and New York to Minneapolis, Las Vegas and Silicon Valley. Thank you for joining us and being such an important part of our journey. It will take women and men working together as a unified force to drive true change, meaningful change and sustained change. This is at the heart of International Women's Week. It is not simply a series of events, it is a driver for long-term sustained change. And the objectives we are pursuing together have never been more important. We know the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women, particularly those from marginalized communities. This issue impacts all of us, our economy, our society, and our community. Recent research from McKinsey Global Institute shows that women make up 39% of global employment, but account for 54% of overall job losses. Taking action now to advance gender equality could add 13 trillion, trillion to global GDP by 2030, compared with the gender regressive scenario that is occurring now with the number of women who are considering leaving the workforce. Here in Canada, increasing the number of women entrepreneurs could add between 41 billion and 81 billion to our national economy and increasing the minority entrepreneurs could have a similar effect. Together as an integrated and unified community, we believe we can leave our country and the world. Our team is committed to driving progress on this imperative with all of you and it truly is a journey. We are proud to collaborate with so many champions and allies who join us today. This includes the entrepreneurs, innovators, firms, and other clients. We are so proud to serve every single day at Invest Ottawa and many members of our ecosystem. Our board of directors, mentors, advisors, sponsors, partners, critical investors, including the City of Ottawa, the Province of Ontario, and the Government of Canada, including our friends at FedDev Ontario, and of course our team, the employees at Invest Ottawa and Bayview, who drive action on these goals every single day through the programs and services we deliver. Today, we come together for an afternoon of inspiration and actionable insight on a critical shared objective for us to enable and accelerate the growth and success of women founders and women-owned business leaders from every walk of life. Together, we've established a bold vision. We want to be the best region in the world for women founders to launch, grow and scale successful, sustainable, globally oriented companies. Companies that anchor and grow here in thriving business technology hub on our main streets and create a wealth of new jobs, attract capital and take on the world. This includes the creation of Ottawa's first $100 million woman owned and led business. It will take sustained collaboration to realize this vision and our community is founded on it. You will experience this today and in many days ahead. It underpins our launch event. Welcome to the F Factor Fueling Women Founders. We are gonna take a brief moment to walk through our agenda today and we have prepared a few slides so that you know what is coming up. I am very honored to welcome in just a moment, my good friend Shav Haspel McIntosh, who serves as our co-chair for our Women-Owned Business Subcommittee. 
We will then move into a presentation that will be delivered by Susan Richards and Michael Tremblay, providing an overview and an update on our journey. How are we at Invest Ottawa and Bayview Yards progressing against our strategy, the targets and the goals we have set with all of you? And moving forward, we will then launch into our keynote panel discussion, the F Factor panel that brings together entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders from here across our great ecosystem, led by my friend and colleague, Michelle Yunus, our Director of Venture Development. And then we will move into a fantastic virtual activity for those parents who have children that might need a little bit of infotainment. Big shout out to our friends at WeTech in Windsor for bringing forward this amazing idea. Yvonne, I hope you are with us. This is an opportunity for children to experience Little Ray's Critters, many of them, a great local business. If you need any support on registering, getting logged in, please drop something into the chat and we will take care of your youngsters. We wanna make sure that all parents have an opportunity to enjoy our keynote presentation, which follows. At about 3.35, we are thrilled to welcome Mandela Schumacher Hodge Dixon, a leader out of Oakland, California, who delivers an amazing program called Founder Gym. We have worked for three years to bring her together with us in our ecosystem and could not be more thrilled. And that will wrap up our very exciting program for today. And then we have 12 days of integrated programming, something we've done very different this year with International Women's Week. We've looked at very specific challenges and opportunities with that pandemic lens for women founders, aspiring and current leaders right across our ecosystem in all equity seeking groups. So we've got much more targeted and specialized content this year, thanks to the partners that have come together to deliver. This is just a sampling of some of the events that Invest Ottawa is really privileged to be engaged in and help to lead. Please visit our calendar, Invest Ottawa backslash IWW, so that you have an opportunity to see the 39 events and growing and choose those that are meaningful to you and really gain great experience and impact from this week that we have assembled. Without further ado, I am going to hand the virtual mic over to our friend and colleague, Siobhan Haspel McIntosh, who is the Global Diversity and Belonging Lead for Shopify. She's a director on our board and she is the chair of our subcommittee. She is also a great friend to Invest Ottawa Bayview and our community. Thank you, Shav, for being with us. No problem. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. And thank you for that very generous introduction. So hello, everybody. My name is Siobhan, but everybody calls me Shav. And like Sonia said, I'm the diversity and belonging senior lead over at Shopify and have been a member of this amazing Invest Ottawa Baby Yards team as a board member and co-chair of our female founder and woman-owned business subcommittee since 2019. My entrepreneurship story runs deep, passed down through lineage from my great grandparents to my grandparents to my parents and now to me. When my family first immigrated to Canada from Grenada, many of them chose the national capital region, Ottawa, as where they would call home and lay down their roots. Many of my family members turned to entrepreneurship as a way to thrive and as a means of survival. While there were many failed businesses along the way, over time and with the help and support of their community, they were able to create thriving businesses. And although they may not consider themselves entrepreneurs, that's exactly what they are. One of the many goals we're trying to accomplish here at Invest Ottawa is to disrupt the narrative that exists for so many entrepreneurs from underrepresented and underserved communities, ensuring that all people see themselves in entrepreneurship and consider it not just as a means of survival, but as an economically viable path to take and be supported along. The work that we're doing here at Invest Ottawa with the support and guidance of the community and our entire ecosystem is close to my heart, not just personally, but also as a diversity, equity and inclusion practitioner. Our goal is not to just ensure that we're supporting and inspiring entrepreneurship across industries and at different phases of the entrepreneurial journey. So from startup to scale up, but we are doing the crucial work to ensure that we are supporting, uh, sorry, we're doing the crucial work to ensure that when we say entrepreneur, it is inclusive of all people across all dimensions of diversity. When we say we're here to support women entrepreneurs and founders, it's from an intersectional lens that is inclusive of all women across race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, ability, socioeconomics, newcomer status, nobody is going to get left behind. 
We have seen the research, the disproportionate impacts of the pandemic on women entrepreneurs and women owned businesses, especially those from underrepresented and underserved communities. And more than ever, the work that we're doing here at Invest Ottawa and the work that we have ahead of us as a collective community is absolutely crucial. Now this journey is not linear and I'm not gonna lie and stand up here and say that it's not without its challenges. But the team at Invest Ottawa is committed to doing the necessary work to address and disrupt systems of inequalities that exist for entrepreneurs from underrepresented and underserved communities. And we are engaging in this work for the long term. We're not just here for the short game, we're here for the long term. International Women's Week and our women owned business strategy are just critical steps in supporting a broader diversity and equity and inclusion goals. This includes the public commitments that we made last summer to become a better ally and to actively address and fight against systemic racism. I won't go through all of the work that's being done and you'll hear some more from Mike a little bit later in the programming, but I think it's important and really exciting just to go over a couple of points and a couple of steps that we have taken to those commitments that we made last summer. So we just heard from Rita Alba, who is our amazing diversity and belonging lead and strategist. Uh, she's really going to help us hit the ground running and she already has done so much work already. She's going to ensure that the work that we're being done that's being done is equitable, scalable, and will create transformational and systemic change, not just surface level change. We're also working in collaboration with Lunaria, which is a woman led and owned company that combines software with expert advice to create holistic diversity, equity and inclusion solutions. Out of that collaboration, we have launched our first internal inclusion and equity and diversity survey. That's really gonna help us guide the development of our internal strategy, the programs and support targeted to the needs of our current and future workforce. Taking a data informed approach to diversity, equity and inclusion is essential. And we are applying that thinking, not just in terms of understanding the areas of opportunity that exist internally, but also leveraging data to understand who our programs are reaching and who they are not. Like the saying goes, you have to know where you are to know where you need to go. And if we don't know where the gaps exist in terms of the reach of our programs, it will be impossible to build a strategy that identifies the opportunities to systematically engage entrepreneurs and firms from all equity seeking groups. And in order to build and deliver programs and services that can actually help them grow and succeed and scale up. We are on a journey. We have a long way to go and we are grateful to be on the path with the support of our community. Thank you to everyone for being a part of it, for sharing your ideas, your feedbacks, your suggestions. We are going to emerge from this pandemic stronger and more resilient as a community. I'm sure of this. Thank you all for making the time to be here today. Thank you to the phenomenal team at IO for building an amazing 12 days of programming and to all of the amazing partners who worked to bring this to life. And now I will pass the virtual mic back over to Sonia. Thank you so much, Shav, and our heartfelt thanks. Our entire team uh, is so grateful for all of the time, expertise, and experience you invest in us, as if you were an extended member of your team. I'm certain that you're on our payroll. I am absolutely certain we share you with Shopify. Thank you so, so much. No problem. It's now my privilege to call forward our co-chair of Invest Ottawa, Susan Richards. She is also the founder and CEO of Number Crunch. She is going to kick off the opening of our journey, and that will be followed by our CEO, Michael Trombley. Susan, over to you. Wonderful. I'm so excited to be here and thank you for kicking us off in such a fine way. Um, first of all, can I be heard well? Looks like, thank you, Sonia. Great. Welcome everybody to the season of celebrating our progress in forging a more gender balanced world. International Women's Day or week or month really is where we're headed is for celebrating the achievements of women and for calling for gender parity. The rise of women is not about the fall of men. Gender balance is not solely a women's issue. It's also an economic issue. Advocacy, inclusion and mindsets, tangible action are needed from all. Many societies have moved on from women having to succeed in a man's world. Stereotypes are being challenged and diverse representation of women is more rep 
more evident. There is still a continuing need worldwide for more progressive mindsets and inclusive behaviors to be forged. Collectively, everyone everywhere can strive for women's equality and continue to make positive gains. We are moving to exciting times in history where the world now expects equity, expects diversity, expects inclusion. And now it's all up to us to choose to challenge and consistently commit to call out inequity. Studies from McKay, McKinsey and Company, Lean In Org, Stats Canada, and one of IO's great sponsors, RBC, are, and others are helping us to understand the impacts of COVID-19 on women. Women, especially women of color, are three times more likely to have been laid off or furloughed during the COVID-19 crisis, stalling their careers and jeopardizing their financial security. Women aged 35 to 39 are exiting the labor force in droves, and the statistics show the explanation is motherhood. Mothers with children under six account for two-thirds of the ensuing exits from the labor force. Mothers are more than three times as likely as fathers to be responsible for most of the housework and caregiving. In fact, they are one and a half times more likely than fathers to be spending up to three hours more per day on housework and childcare, equivalent to 20 hours a week or half of a full-time job. Meanwhile, for the one in five mothers who don't live with a spouse or partner, the challenges are even greater. And the situation is worse for women of color who are twice as likely to be handling all childcare and housework for their families. Worry and fear is at an epidemic proportion for women. Mothers are more than twice as likely as fathers to worry about the performance and in the way in that it's being judged negatively because of caregiving responsibilities. They're also far more likely to feel uncomfortable sharing work-life challenges with colleagues. Mothers are twice as likely to be thinking one of us has to quit our job or close our business than fathers. Senior level women have a vast and meaningful impact on a company's culture. They are more likely than senior level men to embrace employee friendly policies and to champion racial and gender diversity. Over 50% of senior level women say they consistently take a public stand for gender and racial equity at work, a 25% higher rate than senior level men. And they're more likely to mentor and sponsor one or more women of color. 38% of senior level women currently mentor or sponsor one or more women of color, which is a 65% higher rate than that of senior level men. Women entrepreneurs are also experiencing greater challenges than their male counterparts because their businesses are less likely to have been adequately financed to begin with. They're less likely to meet the qualifying criteria of COVID-19 funding programs, and they're more likely to be in operating in the sectors that were the greatest hit by the pandemic. And most of these issues are amplified for racialized, indigenous, and immigrant women, as well as those with disabilities. So for all of us, there are some six key areas where companies can focus or expand efforts to help. Number one, make work more sustainable. Two, reset norms around flexibility. Three, take a close look at performance reviews. Four, take steps to minimize gender bias. Five, adjust policies and programs to better support employees. And six, strengthen employee communication. Ottawa companies have demonstrated a growing commitment to gender diversity over the past five years. Community leaders across Ottawa have been coming together like never before to inspire, educate, amplify, and take the stage in support of greater equity for all. That commitment is more important than ever right now. If we rise to the moment with continued bold action, we can protect hard won gains in gender diversity and build the foundations for a better workforce long after COVID-19 is behind us. Now, I'd like to hand the virtual mic over to Mike to tell us more about uh, the journey at IO and share some great information about our progress to date. I think you're on mute. <laughs> the there we go, the classic tagline of 2020. This is, <laughs> this is why I was asking if you could hear me okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much. I, I do want to start off by uh, by uh, thanking our speakers so far and uh, just a couple of acknowledgements. So firstly, Sonia, you've been uh, such a champion for us uh, on this mission uh, that I, I just can't thank you enough for getting us to, to this level. You and your team as well for International Women's Week. Uh, I know that uh, Katie LeClaire has been hugely active in this, as uh, has Jess Ward behind the scenes helping uh, us even with today's event. 
and of course the whole marketing communications team, an absolute machine in getting the word out. So I do wanna thank you for that. And for Rita, who has become my, uh, my personal coach uh, to ensure that I am on point for understanding how to look around corners when it uh, comes to diversity, inclusion and belongingness. Uh, thanks for your mentorship and coaching. It's, it's really meant the world to me. I appreciate that very much. I'd also like to thank Shav. Her opening comments have been absolutely uh, fantastic. And uh, Shav has been with us uh, almost from the start, not quite from the start, but almost from the start. But her impact has been with us every single day since she's joined on to, to help us out with the directions that we needed to go in as a company. And then of course, Susan, uh, our, uh, our steady co-chair uh, with the mayor of the city of Ottawa. Uh, we are so blessed to have you with us. Uh, you are inspiring. Uh, you are a true leader in our community. Thank you for all that you do for us. So I have a, a number of things that I wanna to talk to you about this afternoon. Um, and I, I'm gonna lead into sharing with you some of the uh, by the numbers on how we're performing as a region. Um, and it's a journey. I, I want everybody to know that this is, uh, this is like uh, a few steps in. We've got a long way to go here. Uh, but we have come a fair distance, and I do want to make sure we acknowledge a bit of that. So to begin with, our company set out a vision. Um, it's almost four years ago now. I've, I've been with the company now four years. Our vision was uh, a bit ambitious, uh, but as a city of a million people, if you want to get somewhere, you really do have to be clear in your direction. So we picked our words pretty wisely and carefully. Uh, we wanted to enable to achieve, uh, Ottawa to achieve its full potential as a globally recognized future focused region. And we wanted to use words like that because you know, if you're gonna achieve the full potential of your region, you have to bring everyone with you. This can't be around one group or another. If you do wanna have impact, you really do have to think about uh, the organization that is coming with you uh, and the, the community that you're with. And so part of that ambition was to make sure that as a company, uh, we were um, giving everyone that opportunity to move uh, forward. And I, I, uh, last year, I talked a little bit about my two daughters and my son. Um, I, I've got uh, two daughters, one of which is, uh, is uh, a Shopify. Um, uh, she's become a dev, actually. And uh, she started off as an artist uh, and loved that. And the creative side of that uh, found its way into building the creative side of Shopify websites. Now she's doing the dev side, all self-taught. Uh, my middle daughter is, uh, is in astrophysics at Carleton. She's 10 feet above me uh, in, in the control room working on her studies right now. And then my son as well, who is 15. He's a hockey player uh, in normal periods. And, uh, you know, I want him to grow up in an environment where uh, he feels um, and understands the importance of uh, equity and fairness and diversity and that he's part of it. So these events shouldn't be just with women. This, these events should be with all of us to lift all of us forward. I was very fortunate as a, a young boy. I mean, at six, seven years old, I had such ambition and I had no headwinds, zero headwinds. I could go in any direction I wanted to. I did not feel constrained in any way. And I would wish that for anyone that has, uh, has ambition and has drive. And we should all come together to help support those, uh, those bold ambitions and uh, give people what they need to be able to move things forward. So four years ago, we set out on ambition and uh, I think that we've made some progress. One of the first things we did is we, we listened carefully to what was happening around us. And we knew that the plan we put in place was a good plan, but it wasn't perfect. And we knew that we needed to lean in more in terms of the governance of how our business works. And so we did introduce a um, subcommittee of our board. Uh, you see the members uh, on the screen. I, I think we're all looking at the same screen at this moment. Uh, three of our board members are on the slide, but everyone on this, uh, on this chart has been with us for several years, helping us, not just attending board meetings, but leaning in and doing the hard work that it takes uh, every week, uh, every month to advance the cause. And I couldn't be more grateful for the advice and the engagement that you've had with our community. And so uh, for that, uh, we'll, we'll always be grateful. So I wanna move now to the, um, the next uh, piece. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through a series of, of numbers. Um, first framing, of course, the goals that we'd set out. 
Um, early on, of course, we wanted to ensure that we established a, a basic foundation for success. And part of that is to make sure that you're talking to the right audiences and you're creating a, a pipeline of opportunity for those that have ambition. And also uh, when I think about things like uh, even our board and our board governance. Uh, if you want to uh, make sure that you're covering uh, the market in the appropriate way, you need to have a governance structure that uh, actually is active in that respect. And we do have a balanced board at this stage. Uh, and we have a balanced board without compromise. We have an incredibly strong board, uh, just happens to be half men and half women. And I believe there's room for uh, some years having more women, uh, uh, some years possibly having a few more men. But the, the, the power of having a diverse board has really shown up in the programming we've been doing for several years now. So I'm very proud of that. And I think it's an important part of having a foundation and the ambition that we've been talking about this afternoon. The second part is, uh, and I will share the numbers with you, but we had an intention last year coming into this year to do a full assessment of our market end to end. We usually do this with the city every four to five years uh, in order to get a very good comprehensive view of what's happening on the ground in our city. Now, with the pandemic, we've had to defer that. Um, we do have the opportunity of having a census happen during the course of this year, which will help to fold into some of the research that we need to do. But I want everyone to know that our intention is to have a very strong baseline. Shav mentioned that in her opening comments. Um, if you want to know where you're going where, where to go, you really have to have a good grounding on where you are in order to fill in and deal with those gaps. And so we do have uh, an intention to do this. Uh, but we need to do this when we get into a period where we have a more normalized economy, which is coming. And then finally, of course, and uh, this is uh, very much a North America wide event this week, isn't it? When you uh, heard back how many people we have outside of the region, uh, we do have ambition for our programming. And I think in, if in some small way we're inspiring other regions to uh, get behind this notion of giving everyone opportunity I can tell you that uh, means the world to me and my colleagues. And so that, that's, uh, that's how we view this. Let's move to uh, some of the numbers now. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on strategy a little bit and then we'll get into numbers. So everything that, uh, yeah, you can go back. So everything on this slide is, uh, is so well represented in the 39 events that we have over the next 10 days. There is a 40th event. I, I want you to know last year we had 40 events. Um, and, uh, but I can't announce the 40th one yet. Uh, we, we got confirmation signing and I Friday night. I can tell you it's really exciting and we will get it on the board, uh, I'm hoping within a week. Uh, we're just uh, working out the finishing details, but I, I will tell you that it'll be March 29th. So this is now um, officially International Women's Month. Uh, so we are very excited to share the details of that in the coming days. But our goal for, for the, the work that we do is very much uh, in evidence in all of the programming you'll see this week in uh, promoting and putting a spotlight on, uh, on women, uh, providing educational experiences, uh, opportunities for mentorship, and uh, the connections that really make things happen. And so the strategy is all built into a very strong, immersive website that we have. Uh, you can get to it right from the Invest Ottawa website. Uh, tools and resources, and it's constantly building, being built up. So the strategy we have is, is one that is for the long haul. Uh, so we are in this for the long haul, and you'll see these resources continue to build. Okay, let's go to the numbers, and uh, I want, I'm, I'm very excited to share these. So despite a pandemic, uh, you look at uh, our, um, our pre-accelerator programming, and what this is is a 10 uh, a ten week boot camp. Uh, I think we're uh, calling for our 11th cohort right now. Uh, where we help to prepare uh, those with ideas and companies that are just at the start to be equipped to be, to, to be able to take advantage of the accelerator programming that, that we do have. Um, and so when you think about where we are right now, uh, we have uh, an average of 37% of participants uh, are either uh, co-led by women uh, or, uh, or led by women, uh, which, is, which is actually quite significant. 11 of the 20 pitch competition awards uh, have actually um, uh, uh, been connected to uh, or, uh, founders or, uh, or um, uh, co-led by women, 55% on average between the two years that we've uh, done it this way. 
And uh, uh, last year at this time, we were finishing off our health tech uh, program. So we had the first vertical uh, pre-accelerator on health tech, 69% uh, of the uh, final pitch uh, competition were actually delivered by women, uh, which is really significant. And uh, it's gratifying to see this because it, it happens uh, with intentionality uh, and it happens with uh, persistence and uh, continued focus. So that's our pre-accelerator. Um, and I do wanna take a moment just to thank Erin uh, uh, Siegmiller for her work uh, on the IO pre-accelerator. She also has done an enormous amount of, of work on the SheBoot programming as well. So thank you, Erin, for your effort in, in making this work uh, come alive for us. Let's move to the next one, please. So, uh, 12 of the IO accelerator tech companies. Uh, so this is in our full accelerator program now, um, are uh, either led or co-led by women. 19% um, seems like an, a low number, but it is a significant improvement. It's a 50% improvement. Again, you're, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna see these seismic changes uh, happen with uh, snapping fingers. This is consistent focus. Mm -hmm. Almost half our coaches and mentors now are women. Uh, and that, that matters as well in, in ensuring that we have an environment that is supportive and conducive uh, and attractive to women-owned founders. Uh, so um, very, very important progress in that. And I do want to thank uh, Michelle Yunus for her focus and her energy uh, with the um, Invest Auto Accelerator programming. You really make a difference. Uh, it's great to have you with us in your leadership position. So let's move to the next one. Just to give you a sense of the, the, uh, the companies that uh, are, are actually part of the 12, uh, these are they. Uh, Hyperion has uh, actually acquired uh, Tandem Technical this past year. Uh, but these are all great companies, uh, leadership companies, companies that help our other companies uh, in our accelerator programming. All right, so we're going to move to the next one. So the next one is, um, I think, really important. And this was really illuminating for all of us at Invest Ottawa. So, Digital Main Street uh, is a programming that was introduced uh, by FedDev Ontario as a, as a strategy that they, they wanted to invest in. It picks up on some work that had been done in Toronto uh, for a number of years. Um, and what it does is it helps companies that are you know, traditional companies, bricks and mortar companies, uh, to move into more of the, uh, the digital age uh, and to future-proof their businesses through periods like a pandemic. And so the work that has gone in here has been uh, absolutely enormous. And uh, this builds on a lot of the work that we've done in the past uh, with something called the Small B Business uh, Enterprise Center. That's led by Paula Hopkins. Uh, she's, uh, I think, on the line with us today. She's done just a brilliant job. We, we actually run the largest small business enterprise center in, in the province, which equipped us beautifully for going after uh, the digital Main Street programming and making sure that we delivered a ton of value with that. And so let me share a couple of numbers. So the percentages don't really tell the whole story. So the first part of it is uh, on uh, DMS uh, future proofing, which is a lot of the coaching and mentoring we provide as value added. 70% uh, self-identified as women leaders. That's 492 companies out of 701. Like these, these are big numbers that, that we're, we're dealing with here. Um, you know, I knew the number would be significant. I didn't know that it would be 70%. Second is around uh, completed digital Main Street digital transformation projects. These are things like adding a Shopify channel uh, to, to your business. 69% self-identify as women. This is 158 companies out of 229 took the plunge and went with it, which is really exciting. The third one down, uh, digital transformation pipeline, 71%. Uh, as uh, you know, identified as women leaders, that's 393 out of 550 companies. Like this is a big pipeline. And then finally looking at uh, sole proprietor clients in the Digital Main Street Digital Transformation Project Pipeline. Again, things like uh, how do I take advantage of, uh, uh, of uh, e-commerce uh, capability and uh, to make sure you're visible on searches, that kind of thing. 78% identified as women. That's 155 out of 198 companies. That's a big deal. Uh, so very, very proud of the work that the team has been uh, doing uh, in partnership with uh, partners across the province. 
uh, Communitech, uh, Tabia, and others. Uh, it's been it's been a great partnership, and it's having real impact. So thank you for that. Move to the next one. Starter Company Company Plus, the BIPOC program. This one is uh, is also um, uh, a very uh, uh, it was illuminating for us because we hadn't really studied the numbers before. So doing things by the numbers, keeping track, understanding the impacts, really important. So starting, Starter Company Plus uh, really helps uh, to support uh, organizations as they move through. They get a lot of mentorship. They get some grant money. And so let me just run through uh, some of the uh, outcomes here. So the first one, 61% identifying as, uh, as women-owned. That's 56 of 91 companies. These are the applications, which is, which is gratifying. Uh, that's, a, that's a good number. The second is around uh, participants that got into the program, 64% self-identify as women as the leaders. The third one on the grants piece, uh, the grants are $2,500 each. Um, and so 62% of the grant recipients self-identify as women. And when you look at the awards that have been put out, so as of uh, February, 45K went out, and we'll be able to get that up to 90K by the end of March. And that, uh, so 18 companies leading to the 45K, uh, and we'll be doubling that by the end of March. So significant uh, focus, uh, the coaching, the mentorship, all of the effort in behind this takes a lot of time and effort, but every minute of it is worth it. And that'll move us then to, uh, actually, just before I leave the uh, starter company piece, uh, I did want to recognize uh, Patty Ip for her leadership and her work in that area. All right, so let's move to the uh, final one. Uh, and so this is uh, funding for women in our, our Main Street Entrepreneurs Program. So this is the core the Starter Company Plus program. Again, uh, uh, roughly similar numbers to, to 2019. So uh, you know, roughly flat, but, but the majority are grants that are going to uh, women-owned businesses for the, the two periods. And so uh, very gratifying to see this work happen. Um, going forward, uh, we want to do this by the numbers, so we are going to be establishing a baseline. That's probably a, a, a nine-month effort, and so it'll probably begin some sometime earlier in, 20, in 2022. Uh, but I do want to take a moment to, again, acknowledge all of the great work, uh, not just by our own team, but by the community. This isn't possible with our little team alone. We have gotten here because of the incredible participation and engagement by our partners across the uh, community. Uh, and we're very grateful for that engagement level and that support. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Sonia. On mute. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, it's now my pleasure to bring forward Julia Elvid, SheBoot founder, director at the Capital Angel Network and advisor with Invest Ottawa, and Jennifer Francis, chair of the Capital Angel Network, director of our board and fellow SheBoot co-founder for a special announcement and an update on SheBoot before we move to our panel discussion. So I know that Jess is going to bring them forward. Welcome. There's Julia, and Julia's on mute. And there is Jennifer coming online. Wonderful. And Jess, we will pull forward the slide and we will roll forward. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, amazing statistics uh, and um, amazing change at Invest Ottawa over the last couple of years. Very exciting. Um, so one of the issues um, that's been discussed that holds female founders back is access to capital. And my co-founders, uh, Julia and Sonia and I, really set out to change that uh, by creating the uh, SheBoot Bootcamp, which is an investment-ready bootcamp for women founders by women uh, investors and business people. And during this workshop, um, during the bootcamp, we have a combination of workshops, coaching, and advisory services uh, to really help female founders prepare to raise capital from either VCs or angels as they move forward with their businesses. So we ran the inaugural bootcamp uh, last year, uh, announced it at International Women's Week uh, 2020, one of the last uh, pre-lockdown events. Um, 
And it was, uh, it was a great success. So we had 54 applications from women-led firms, which far exceeded our expectations. It was uh, very exciting to see the, uh, the demand and the number of companies that are starting up and led by women uh, in the region. Out of those 54 firms, we selected 10 women-led firms to participate in our first boot camp. And to talk to you more about the boot camp, I'd like to hand it off to my co-founder, Julia. Thank you, Jennifer. At, um... And I, I, I want to correct one small thing that those uh, <laughs> applications actually came from outside the region as well, remember, right? So True. we we had uh, applications from Calgary, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, all across Ontario. Um, but, um, and, and we're looking to do the same again this year. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it up. What we did, um, we're able to do was um, hand out $200,000 um, of, uh, of different types of funding uh, to uh, the winners um, of the pitch competition. 100,000 of that came from local women angels um, uh, putting you know, each $10,000 towards this $100,000 prize. And thank you angels for coming forward and doing that. As well as that got matched with some non-dilutive funding. Um, and, and that was absolutely fabulous surprise for us um, and from uh, our, our, our friends at FedDev. So we were able to give out uh, two top uh, prizes, uh, one for 150,000, the second prize for 50,000. And uh, we had two crowd favorite awards uh, that allowed those founders to come straight through the uh, Capital Angel Network program right to a members meeting. Go ahead. What we're really excited about now is um, this year. So 2021, um, we've learned a lot. It was quite a program and we got to hear from um, a lot afterwards about what worked and didn't work. And now um, this week, we're opening up applications uh, for invest uh, for the SheBoot 2021 program. Um, moving one slide ahead. Woo, hi. <laughs> The, the, the website here has lots more information and will have the application link. And um, I took a look just before and we still need to, to update that, but that'll be ready tomorrow. And, and what's going to be different this year is um, we'll still be accepting 10 founders into the program um, and uh, the application process will uh, be open all the way through March and April and uh, announcing the winners at the end of June. But what's different is we were, we're going to change how we handle the funds and each founder that gets into the program will receive $10,000 of non-dilutive funding. This funding will be so valuable for them <laughs> to get ready, uh, to be investment ready and to do the polishing they need uh, to go in front of investors later on. There will still be a final pitch prize of 100,000 uh, from um, a group of uh, angel investors. We're hoping that we can move this up. So if you're a woman angel investor out there, send me an email. We'd love to hear from you and we can move that number up to 150,000 or more. Looking forward to it. Handing off back to you, Jennifer, uh, to talk about Capital Angel Network. Great, thanks very much. So part of Im improving the access to capital is uh, programs like SheBoot, and part of it is getting more female funders or, or female angels into the ecosystem, as we know that increasing the number of women who are investing increases the investment dollars available for female founders. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been working with Invest Ottawa, uh, Capital Angel Network and Invest Ottawa for a couple of years now to uh, grow the number of women in Capital Angel Network and across Ottawa who are uh, investing. And uh, so I'm pleased to say that now we've got uh, 10 female angels as members of Capital Angel Network that represents 20% uh, of the network. And uh, just to give you um, something to compare to, uh, across Canada, about 15% of angels are women. So we are above uh, the national average. And uh, through initiatives like SheBoot, and um, we're doing a, a female angel breakfast, virtual breakfast tomorrow morning, uh, we're hoping to continue to increase this so that we can continue to increase the, the funds and the flow of funds uh, to female founders in the region. Um, and I will say as a direct result of increasing the number of female angels at Capital Angel Network, 
Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we've invested in 11 female founded companies. Eight of those are female CEOs and the other three are female president, COO, CTO. Um, but that's very exciting as we increase the, the number of uh, female founded companies uh, funded by Capital Angel Network. And of course, uh, giving the funds needed to be able to move on, continue and scale and grow their companies. So uh, I'm hoping that we will be a part of uh, Invest Ottawa's challenge to get the first female led $100 million company in Ottawa. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm certain you're going to be absolutely critical. And as we <laughs> to the last slide, we do have a couple of other slides. We want to get right into the meat of hearing from our women owned business leaders and founders. We're going to share this deck. We've come a long way as a community, and I'm so proud of, of the work that so many have done together with us at Invest Auto and Bayview. Here's just a few statistics about our governance and operations. All of this will be online. I want to thank Jennifer and Julia and everyone who has played such a pivotal role in helping us to take these steps forward. It is a journey. We have a long way to go. We are grateful for everyone who is supporting us. And with that, I am now going to ask Jessica Ward to pull these slides down and we are gonna move right into our panel discussion. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you, Michelle Yunus, our Director of Venture Development and Invest Ottawa, who will be your moderator today. Great, thanks, Sonia. So before we dive into our panel discussion, I wanted to quickly set the stage by reflecting on our themes for today's event. We will bring Michelle right back up. This is the virtual world. This is COVID. Yeah. Yes. I, I think she just uh, did the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. She is back with us. Welcome, Michelle. Back. Okay. <laughs> I will, uh, I'm not sure how, how much of my spiel got included, but um, basically I just want to reflect on the themes for today's event before we dive in. So the themes are fierce, fearless, and focused. And these words on their own sound great, but to me, it's really the meaning and the action behind them, especially when tied to being a woman uh, that I find truly powerful. So having worked with many women entrepreneurs and leaders over the years, I just wanted to share what these three words mean to me. So fierce is being strong and courageous. A fierce woman stands up for herself and others when the going gets tough. Fearless is not the absence of fear, but it's really feeling it and pushing through it to achieve a goal. A fearless woman tries new things and gets back up if it doesn't work out. And finally, focused is keeping your eye on the ball while still pivoting fast if needed. A focused woman uses her time and energy wisely. I would love to hear what these words mean to you in the audience. So please feel free to chime in via the chat. Uh, Sonia will actually be moderating the chat. So please post any questions that you have for the panelists in there and we will save 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer your questions. And our panelists are ready to have a real and raw conversation on some really important and relatable topics. And I'm certain that they will inspire you and equip you with valuable new perspectives and ideas in your journey, whatever that might be. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our four panelists to introduce themselves. And to add a bit of a personal touch, um, I'd like if they could share one thing that brings some joy in their life. So I think we've got almost all, we've got our panelists here, awesome. So I will, let's start with you, Andrea. <laughs> of course. So. Um, hi everybody, I'm so happy to be here and be a part of this panel. Uh, my name is Andrea Winter. Um, I joined Martello Technologies last year, uh, February, 2020, just before the pandemic as the VP of People. Um, I've been in HR for, you know, about 20 years and, you know, I would say that my focus in HR is enabling leaders um, um, at all levels and driving forward those strategic initiatives, but taking a practical approach to things. Um, I would also say that my superpower is um, creating meaningful relationships with everybody that I interact with. Um, and, um, you know, I'm a mom of two, 11 and an 18 year old. and you know, what, drink, what brings me joy outside of work? Um, I like to try new activities that push me out of my comfort zone. Um, so over the last couple of years, that's seen me participate in the CrossFit Games, um, 
running a half marathon um, and uh, participating and winning uh, a physique competition. So it's just kind of some of the things that I like to do um, to keep me on my toes. Awesome. Thank you. Let's move over to Ashley next. Andrea, you are a superwoman. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Ashley Kennedy. I'm the founder and CEO of Neurovine. It's a company that is designed to make brain health visible for patients and clinicians. And we are starting by helping concussion patients recover better, efficiently, and safer. Um, I am a mom of three little wild monkeys. And the thing that brings me joy is getting out into nature. Um, so over the past three years, I've actually started every morning by walking our dog up a really massive hill into a forest. Um, and every morning, the exhaustion of the climb reminds me to be thankful for my capacity. And walking through the forest reminds me um, of how small the problems that I am overcoming actually are um, and how permanent the forest is. And so it's just a really good perspective um, for me to start my mornings with. And it, it does bring a lot of joy. Amazing. Thanks, Ashley. Let's move on to Julia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julia Slanina. I'm the founder and CEO of Treehouse Medical. We are an Ottawa-based femtech company focused on uh, building a care management solution for the maternal health community. I'm a mom to one kinder-aged son um, who is very happy to be back in school, and I'm very thrilled that he is back <laughs> as of February the 1st. Um, what brings me joy? I'm very similar and to some extent, um, perhaps with Ashley, because I'm a huge nature lover as well. And uh, for me, um, I, I'm an avid hiker. I love to hike. And for me, that's something that is really necessary on a, on a weekly basis for me to make the time to go out um, and just escape everything. I turn off my phone uh, for at least four hours on a Sunday. And that's what really brings me joy is to be outside, uh, to canoe, to hike, and just to get away from, from any screen possible. Thanks, Julia. And last but not least, we'll turn it over to Tusha. Hey, uh, I'm Tusha Agampoti. I'm head of engineering at TRED. We're a software company uh, building a platform for construction companies that are moving heavy material, um, really just optimize and track their workflows. Um, I've been in software uh, all of my career. I'm also a mom to two kids, five, uh, five no, seven and nine. And um, I would say what brings me joy is really um, trying to find ways to delight my kids, which you know, kind of uh, aligns with the fearlessness because it fails half the time. So I only succeed in like half of my ideas. So I'm learning how to try things and fail, you know, and take some risks. So, yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. So we have a lot to talk about today. So I will just jump right into the questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we're gonna have a great conversation. So my first question for you is, um, you are all inspirational women leaders in tech. And while the tech industry can be a very dynamic and exciting place, it's also known to have unique challenges specifically for women. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us about a time where you experienced a barrier and you broke through it and how you did that. Um, I can start us off. So. I've experienced lots of barriers um, as a woman in STEM, um, but I think, um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of fun overcoming those barriers throughout my career. Uh, and so, you know, meeting these women on the panel and starting to think about these barriers more deeply, the reason I, I take such joy in finding barriers um, in my career and kind of have made a career out of finding barriers and trying to break them um, is because growing up I saw um, a lot of the areas that I was passionate about, there, there was no one like me in the room. Um, and so it was really important for me that that wasn't a stop sign, um, you know, that, that I could be the only girl in the coding class or physics class. Uh, and it really lit a fire in me to pursue change. Um, I was deathly shy and still am fairly shy. And so 
I've had to really find my voice at the table in these rooms where, where quite often I still don't see anybody that, that is like me at the table. Uh, and, it's, and it's helped me to overcome imposter syndrome. And I think one of the biggest barriers so far is it's not actually an external barrier. It's a barrier I've created for myself. Um, and it was making the decision to jump off the cliff and to create Neuroline. Um, of course, it was filled with imposter syndrome and anxiety and biases, but um, I really knew I needed to launch the company because I saw that we could affect change um, for individuals with, with brain disease and, and brain injury. Um, and I was also really committed to making the path smoother for the next generation. Um, and I think having children really helps um, to have the, the confidence um, to break those barriers because you see, um, you, just, you just want your children and that generation to have a smoother pathway towards their goals. Um, so that's been a really important factor in why um, I continue to find barriers and, and, and affect change. Um, and I just wanted to mention, I think the how in how I'm able to find balance in, in breaking barriers um, and to keep grounded is that um, I do have these other commitments, commitments outside the tech ecosystem. Um, and so I'm not spending 80 hours a week on the company. Um, for me, Neurovine is my life's work. It's my mission. And so I can't burn out. Um, and so these barriers, you know, they, they could take up 80 hours of your, your week to break them. But for me, it's really important to have balance. Um, and so my family has been key to that. And my faith has been key to that to really keep me healthy along this this journey and keep me working on the barriers, I think. That's amazing. Uh, awesome. I, I mean, I'll jump on to what Ashley was saying, you know, imposter syndrome. I, I'm, I'm not sure that I know a female around that, <laughs> that hasn't experienced that. Um, and I think for me, um, having you know, kind of fallen into HR, which a lot of people say, right? There's, there's not a lot of people who kind of went through school and this is, this is what you wanted to do when you were a kid. Um, and so um, for me getting into HR, you know, I, I have that doubly, right? I, I, I think that there's always somebody out there that, that knows um, more than me. Um, and, you know, I'll say, I also work in an industry where, um, as Ashley has said, there aren't a lot of people who are like me, a woman of color uh, in the tech industry. Um, and so, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to kind of shy to the background. And, you know, when I was at IBM, that was my first opportunity to be a leader. Um, and, you know, that opportunity only came about because I badgered my manager to say, I want to take leadership role, like a leadership training. I know that I'm only a team lead right now, but, you know, when that role comes up, I want to be ready. So. Um, you know, that drive early on to, to be prepared and that feeling that I need to be ready, um, it, it actually came to fruition, right? So, you know, I applied for a leadership role that was in Ottawa and they had all but selected the right candidate. Um, and I contacted the hiring manager. So talk about going outside of my comfort zone. I'm an introvert. So calling somebody out of the blue saying, hey, I'd really like to be considered for that job um, is, is one thing. Um, but going to that interview and very early on, somebody gave me advice, you know, act like you act like you're already in the job. It's not about just dressing that you're already in the job, but just act like you've got it. Um, and that's the first time that I've gone through an interview and haven't highlighted my shortcomings, um, which should be innate to your head. Don't highlight, <laughs> don't highlight what you don't have for the job, um, but really acting like I had the job and highlighting um, what I bring to the table and, and what's different about me. Um, and the hiring manager, when they called me back two days later, they said, you know, the fact that you would take the training was, took the training was great, but the fact that you came to the table um, and just acted like you already had the job, that's what kind of pushed you ahead of this candidate um, that we had all but selected. Um, so, you know, I, I would say, you know, to everybody, act like you've got the job and don't take yourself out of the race. Um, let somebody else do that. Talk about what's great about you and what you're bringing to the table. Um, don't take yourself out um, by mm -hmm. not talking about that. Sure. 
I think finding that confidence is something that we all struggle with and, and it's such a great point. Um, and Ashley, you actually had a great point that segues well into our next question about burnout. You were saying that, you know, you just can't burn out. It's just not an option. Um, so I would like to, to talk about that now, actually. Um, and when I mean burnout, the, the definition that I kind of go by is when you're basically in a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion that's caused by an excessive or prolonged stress. And let's be real, we've been a pandemic, we've been in a pandemic for the past year. It's been long, it's been hard, we're, we're all feeling the stress. Um, and research actually shows that women, particularly mothers, senior level women, and Black, Indigenous, and women of color have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So in some cases, women are just burning out. And um, I think it's really important that we look for ways to prevent that burnout. So I'm wondering if any of you might have some tips or tricks on things that you've implemented in your life to prevent burning out. Yeah, I'm happy to get started on this discussion. I think uh, Susan Richards um, uh, said it beautifully at the beginning of, of our, uh, our talk today about how um, you know, mothers, especially with children under the age of six in particular, and, and how um, women are spending 20 hours a week um, doing housework and household chores. Uh, that's the reality that a lot of us have been living um, even before the pandemic. Um, and it is real in the sense that I think, I think all of us can agree that on this panel, we've all been very overwhelmed over the last year. And um, I take my time um, to, to self-reflect very seriously because um, I am a founder of a startup and um, I have to be the one that doesn't burn out um, and I have to be uh, a role model to my child as well. And for me, what I've um, really committed to is, is taking that time for myself and being able to have self-reflection time, um, that being in a journaling kind of way. I love to journal. I love to kind of take the time by myself and reflect what I need to do. And, and maybe if I feel like something has been so awful one day, um, I write it down and then I look at it a couple days later and I realize really it wasn't that bad and it wasn't that negative um, and I can overcome that. Um, so taking the time to be alone and to reflect by yourself, I think is a, is a huge advantage because um, your mindset is the most important thing. And it's one of your most valuable assets in my belief. Um, if you are positive, um, you're going to, to, you're going to exude that um, as well. Um, and I guess one of the other aspects to, for, for me in particular to, to uh, I'm sorry that my, my uh, lighting is going in and out. I guess there's a cloud by my house. <laughs> um, is, is exercise. And um, whether that is going once a week for a hike, um, I'm a huge lover of HIIT workouts and then that gives me clarity so that even if I'm having a horrible, stressful day where um, I just, I'm really riled up and I'm annoyed, um, I can just do a 30 minute HIIT workout and it can calm me down and it can give me a bit of clarity. So um, exercise and being alone and self-reflection I think is, is incredibly useful. Uh, it strengthens your core and it strengthens um, your focus. Mm -hmm. I can jump into that. Um, you're making me feel bad because I just sit and eat most of the time. I'm not getting much exercise these days. <laughs> um, but so, you know, definitely it's, it's hard. Like uh, I've done okay so far, but I can't tell you that I might not burn out like a week or two from now, depending on how long this continues, you know? So I think um, uh, solidarity is important, you know, because we're not in this alone. Uh, I think I've been lucky because we share, like I agree with what Susan said at the beginning as well, um, sharing a lot of the housework. My partner and I share a lot of the, the work with the kids. Um, he might say he does more of it. And I admit it's not to his face though, but um, and it's been it's been amazing. You know, I, I changed jobs uh, in November and we had a conversation about that, about what I would need from him during that time, because we're both in senior roles at our companies. So I think having those frank discussions has been really helpful for me to say, hey, you know, it's I'm starting a new position. I'm going to need your support in some of the the home things and support with kids a little bit more during that time. Um, so that, that's been amazing. Um, and I have heard, you know, that we're all in this together, but like a storm, some people are in a yacht 
and some people are just swimming in the water. So I think as a leader, um, I've just been aware of uh, giving everyone the support they need. You know, how equity is really important, not necessarily fairness for everyone, but really giving every person what they need, understanding that every person on the team might be in a different situation depending on their living situation, et cetera. Um, and that's been really helpful for me, for my leaders, and I'm trying to do that for my team as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would echo the making time for yourself. Um, you know, it's I, this, the, the pendulum swung the other way for me and, you know, it got close to burnout. And um, the one thing that was missing in there is I was doing everything for everybody else, but nothing for myself. Um, and so as much as it sounds crazy, I'm up at 5 a.m. every morning because I get an hour of quiet time. <laughs> That's just, it's just me and I can do whatever I want. Um, and, you know, we recently gave everybody in Martello um, and uh, access to Headspace for a year. And so meditating and adding that into um, my uh, repertoire, something I've never done before, but just 10 minutes, it's amazing the long lasting effects of it. Um, but yeah, definitely taking time for yourself and not feeling guilty about it. Mm -hmm. had to get past the guilt. Sure. I think as mothers, like we, we do feel guilty taking that time sometimes, but that self-care, it's so important. And um, Tusha touched on something as well, kind of communicating what we need sometimes doesn't always, you know, it, it's not always obvious, but like telling, you know, your spouse or your, your, you know, employees or whoever, like what you need from them is, can be really helpful. So um, these are all amazing answers, and I think I think many have learned things from from these uh, these responses. Um, my next question is actually geared toward our two founders here. So, uh, the pandemic has had different impacts on businesses. For some, it's been a catalyst. It's been you know really fueled their business, and for others, it's created some serious crisis. I'm curious to know how has the pandemic impacted your businesses and have there been any key lessons learned throughout the process? I'm happy to go first, Ashley, if you want. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so for, for my business in particular, you know, we focus on the maternal health community. And so, you know, some of the statistics that you heard at the beginning of today's uh, event, uh, I think um, speak very, very clearly to what we are building in particular at Treehouse Medical. And that is very much supporting the maternal health community and supporting uh, care providers um, that, are, uh, that affect and help women and children from conception to age five. And so for me, COVID-19 has really uh, been an accelerant to, to our business in particular, mainly because it's been able to showcase uh, the need uh, that support, um, the, the need for support, and really uh, the need to focus on building a strong and resilient community. If you provide um, a optimal care to a mother and baby uh, from, from those early days, from conception onwards, you will um, build a stronger brighter future for those children. And in fact, that will lead to a stronger and more resilient community. And so um, that for us has been an incredibly um, a great and pivotal point of our business um, and being, being able to talk about that on a daily basis for me um, is really, really important as a mother, um, you know, and all, all mothers can share the same thing. doesn't matter. They don't need to be in, in tech. Um, you, you want to be able to provide the best start to your child um, so that they can lead um, and, and help others. And so um, for us, it's, it's been great, but it's also showcased to me uh, the impacts that we, what we need to focus on and the challenges that still exist in different communities, in uh, remote communities, in rural communities, and how um, you know, we need to uh, take the time to focus on how we can help those individuals and use the resources that we have uh, to work together uh, in particular. Um, yeah, so I think as founders, we love challenges. We wouldn't be creating companies if we didn't thrive in this kind of environment. Um, and so it's been incredibly stressful and incredibly exciting uh, for our company. We're a digital health company. Um, and so 
similar to Julia, it's been, um, there's been a spotlight on digital health. And so it's been a really exciting chance for us to show the world how important digital health actually is and how important it is to be able to connect with physicians remotely. Um, that being said, we were in the middle of an in-person clinical trial, which was um, testing the efficacy of our solution. And all of a sudden we needed to pivot and be able to run our clinical trials virtually. So that meant creating a massive software in infrastructure, building 40 EEG headbands that read your brain activity while our team was dispersed. And so initially in the first few weeks, I felt like, oh my gosh, my workload has quadrupled. Um, and I felt like a cat being put in a bath. Like I didn't want to do this. You can't make me do it. <laughs> and then, uh, and then our team started stepping up. Um, and so it really forced me to stop micromanaging everything and to let our team shine. And, and incredible leadership has stepped up um, in all areas of the company. And I've had to actually step back and say, oh, I'm actually not the most qualified person in the company to do this. You take it and I'll just support you. Um, and so it's been a really fun shift for me as a leader to start thinking strategically about the future of our company and how to support the team leads rather than trying to lead the whole thing. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thankful um, for our, our team that they've just been rock stars um, during this kind of stressful, potentially isolating time. They've really come together. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna highlight, I think, um, the reason we were successful is because we invested so much in the relationship of our team and in the communication between team members. Uh, and with those strong foundations, we, we could put a lot of weight um, on those foundations because they were, they were strong. We continue to work on, on those relationships um, even though we are isolated from one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely seen that as well. Like really trying to keep your team engaged and making sure that you foster those relationships is incredibly important now, so. Yeah. Um, and actually, you, you keep segueing well into my, my next question. Um, so you had talked a little bit about isolation. And um, we know now, especially with physical distancing measures in place, we know how isolation can really negatively impact our mental health and overall well-being. Um, and we've received feedback from women in our ecosystem that um, fellowship is actually crucial to surviving challenging times like now. Um, I'm curious to know, how have you leveraged your social networks or peers over the past year to kind of to lean on for support? Uh, I guess I can take that one. Um, you know, I, I joined Martello last year, um, right before, you know, we all had to start working from home globally in a pandemic hit. Um, and it, uh, it's actually my first VP role. So, you know, I had anticipated uh, being able to leverage my social network and my ability to build relationships in person um, to really kind of get me through those first few critical months um, in a new role. Um, and, you know, all of that got sucked away <laughs> when, we, uh, when we went into, when we went into lockdown. Um, and, you know, there's a group of women who are HR professionals that I had worked with in the past and we had been, you know, connecting ad hocly, having conversations every once in a while. Um, but that that turned into like my my super group and, and almost like my my lifeline. Um, you know, they were kind of there when you just needed to vent, um, there as a knowledge base, um, there for support. And you know, we just set up regular cadences. Um, and met, and that's not something that I've I've done before. I I, I meet people in person and talk there, but um, doing things virtually is is not hasn't really been my forte in the past, and, and that had to switch um, when we went into the pandemic. So, um, you know, there's that, and then also on the personal side, I have two sisters who, you know, prior to the pandemic, we talk every once in a while, um, but once the pandemic hit and we were all first to kind of forced to talk virtually. Um, it's made our relationship stronger. Um, you know, my, my sister started a new law firm, my other sister started her own business all in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and being able to lean on each other and talking through 
uh, what we're going through and getting advice and suggestions, um, again, just became an invaluable lifeline for me. Um, so, you know, I always, I always say to people, just, you know, keep those connections going personal or professional um, and don't be afraid to, to reach out um, because that's also one of my shortcomings. I'm terrible at asking for help or reaching out, um, but this pandemic forced that and it's, it's been awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I, can, I can jump off of what Andrea has to, Andrea had to say a little bit and, and that's really um, that, you know, since, since the pandemic has started, a lot of new moms in particular who, who we serve in particular and we work directly with and uh, we connect with the providers in particular, is um, we, we're seeing a, a huge influx in um, in postpartum depression and women feeling incredibly isolated. You know, pregnancy and becoming a mother, whether you're a first time mom or you're you know a veteran mom when you're on your fourth um, or fifth, um, or even even if you don't become a mom, I think it just I think it's a really important to to realize that being alone sometimes or living alone can be really really um, isolating and just sheer loneliness. And so um, what we're seeing in particular at Treehouse Medical is, is really being able to, to start building that village around you. And, um, you know, moms traditionally would meet in the park and to chat about how difficult it is and how your baby is not going to bed and, and how um, they're struggling with sleep deprivation. And that doesn't really happen that much anymore. And yes, you can connect virtually. Um, I think that's really important, but just finding the way to kind of communicate and picking up the phone or texting each other, I think that's just the reminder of build, building that village and, and leaning on others because, um, you know, when you look back um, several generations ago, you see how um, women at all of a sudden automatically had that village built around them the moment they became mothers. And that doesn't really happen anymore. Um, now, you know, we have, we're working moms, we're, we're stay at home moms, we're uh, now we're virtual moms. And so um, how do we, how do we ensure that we all kind of still have that village? And I think it's just um, being able to, to ask for that help and, and seeking it out there because it does exist and you don't need to feel um, isolated and you don't need to feel lonely because uh, a lot of us are likely feeling the exact same feelings that, um, that you are feeling, so. Yeah, it's so true. Even the, the people that you think just have it all together and everything is, yeah. you know, going amazing. Like you, you don't know what they might be struggling with. And, and I think that's really important. Um, I'm doing a quick check of the time. The time has flown by. I do have a couple more questions, but I, I wanted to turn it over to Sonia to see if we have any from the audience. We do. We have a question seeking advice from these amazing panelists. Should I take maternity leave or continue to work remotely when I have my child? I would really love some advice. My boyfriend and I live together and we both work remotely and he is here to help. Panelists, guidance. Uh, well, my sister's actually just going through this. Um, she had, they had their baby in November um, of last year and um, both her and her husband are lawyers and they're both working, working at home. I don't want to put that in quotations because he is working. Um, she was doing both, um, uh, but I will say, and, and this is what I said to her and, and she's now kind of decided to take four months off. Um, the time that your baby's sleeping should be the time that you're recouping because there's so little of it. And so um, it's easy to convince yourself that, okay, baby's down, now I can get some work done. And then all of a sudden you aren't actually taking care of yourself and you won't be able to take care of your baby. Um, so um, it is obviously a personal preference. I, I have friends who took three weeks off and then they were back at work. Um, you know, their job supported them in terms of like breastfeeding at work and all of that. Um, but I have found um, with my friends and also with myself that trying to live the dual life of working um, and taking care of a newborn is gonna take its toll somewhere. Um, and then on top of that, when you should be spending time with your baby, so she'll have meetings on Saturday at nine o'clock in the morning when her baby's up and ready to interact, but she can't cause she's gotta take meetings. So um, if you have a workplace that makes it flexible enough that you, that you can do it and still have time for yourself, like by all means, go for it, but just be mindful of the impact um, that it's gonna have. Anyone else? 
I've had three mat leaves. And for me, those have been the most productive dreaming times. Um, so I wasn't in the office, but I had my notepad with me when I was nursing and I was like, and then I could do this and this is how I would execute this thing. And, and I just had this massive notebook filled with vision. Um, and it sustained me through those seasons when I was way too busy to spend time um, really pursuing more strategic vision um, for our company or for my life. Um, so I wouldn't have traded that for anything. Those, those precious years and months of creating vision for my life um, without having to be in the office reporting to anybody. Okay, back over to you, Michelle. We can squeeze in maybe one last question. Yes. Okay, I will. Um, okay, this is a really important question. Um, so studies show that there's a strong business case for diversity, everything from more innovation to a stronger bottom line. And I know that you are all champions for diversity and inclusion within your organizations and companies. Can you tell us about how you translate your passion for diversity and inclusion into action? I can take this one. I'll go first anyway. Um, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, my passion, I love building teams. And uh, I'm happiest if I'm sitting in a meeting or on a call these days um, where my team is sharing different ideas, different perspectives. I always say, you know, if you're all in a room together and you're agreeing with each other, that's an email. You don't have to meet to do that. Um, you know, and there's a lot of studies that talk about how anytime you add diversity to a team and you can see diversity, then the people in the room start understanding that that it's different is okay and difference is accepted, you know, and that in turn means that they can share their different opinions and different perspectives. So with that in mind, I'm always thinking, you know, when it comes to hiring the best person for the job, are they bringing a different perspective to this table that I have? So that's kind of like a requirement that I'm thinking about. Are they bringing, are, are they broadening our perspective? And with that in mind, I work really hard to really just increase my pipeline, you know, like I don't, it doesn't matter to me what the pipeline is. There's a lot of data that talk about like coming out of STEM because I'm in software. It might be a certain percentage, but really I want a balanced pipeline. It means I have to look harder. I have to look further and where I wouldn't normally look to recruit talent, but it's worth the effort because in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, I want to innovate. I want to build the best product. And for that, I need a diverse team. Amazing. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Sonia. Go for it, Ed, Julie. I was just going to say other thoughts. And then we have one question in the chat, but I'd love to hear from other yeah. panelists on this. Um, for us in particular, I think um, uh, for me, what I what I talked about, kind of building a, a, the future and building a strong, resilient kind of future for our children. Um, what we've been kind of uh, actively doing at Treehouse Medical as well is kind of working with the Ottawa Catholic School Board in particular to give the ability to bring youth uh, into our organization and allow them to see um, what uh, ICT and what digital marketing kind of looks like because I find that you know um, girls sometimes are interested in STEM but they don't really understand what it is and so we're building kind of a, a femtech medtech solution and so um, allowing youth to be able to see um, you know how healthcare is shaped outside of a clinical role outside of a hospital setting is really important um, and allowing them to to have that exposure through our kind of internship and, and co-op program via the Ottawa Catholic School Board has been really incredibly helpful for us but also um, it's it's allowed a lot of these youth to be able to see something different. Um, you know, I had uh, I had one girl in particular uh, who joined our team for a, a matter of a few months, and she was very interested in becoming a nurse. Um, and then being able to see kind of all of the maternal providers that we serve and how our technology helps, um, you know, allowed her to kind of really rethink maybe it's, maybe there's something else that I want to pursue. Um, so that for me is really warming um, and and really kind of gives me a lot of enthusiasm to to work every day because um, we're helping so many individuals at various different uh, uh, age groups. 
That's amazing. Just a little sidebar. Julia is one of the top five Canadian contestants for Mom Pitch. Oh, and thanks, she's Sonia. making that virtual stage in March. <laughs> we are going to be rooting for you. Yes, we are. Thank you. March 15th. March 15th. <laughs> yeah. Thanks we very have, much. We have one more anonymous question that's popped up in the chat box. How would you advise women who might not want to have kids coming from a place of concern for feeling that you just can't have it all, the concern of wondering how you would ever be able to juggle a career and a family without losing something? How timely for this group, given the discussion? You know, of course, it's it's whatever is right for, for you, uh, but having a family and running a startup, they enhance each other um, and they make me a better leader and um, and frankly, a better mom. Um, my kids, especially in this remote world, are seeing our entire company dynamics. Um, you know, they see me before massive, you know, discussions and negative confrontational, potentially confrontational situations and, um, and I think that they make me a better leader and knowing that they're, they're watching. And then um, I'm a better mom because of, because of the work that I'm doing. So uh, for me, it's really hard, um, but I would not say that I am unable to have the full experience of both. Yeah, I echo, echo what Ashley's saying. It, um, it would be um, a it would be a shame to make a decision because of fear of something. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you just have to be mindful of, you know, what having it all means. Having it all doesn't mean you have to do it all. Um, you know, even if you're a single mom, um, again, having that community around you um, to help you. Um, but I, I agree. I, and, you know, this, this past year and a half, I, I adopted my my niece because my sister passed away. So I went from one and done to having two kids and, and one of them that's kind of dealing with trauma and growing up, right? She's turned 18. Um, but all of that and starting a new role in the middle of a pandemic um, has made me um, a better person, a better mom, a better person at work um, and just a better person, a better person of, my, like, of who I am. Um, but it is personal choice, right? Some, for some people, it's, it's, um, it's one or the other. It's, it's too hard to juggle both, but yeah, that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> and to add really qu quickly, I think setting your boundaries is really important. I think we mentioned that before. That's super important, especially when my kids were really small um, and not very independent. Like I, I gave my 100% when I was at work, but my evening time was my evening time. And I was really clear to any new company I was joining. I was clear that, you know, you can have me 100% during this time. But after that, my family is really important to me. So I think definitely setting your boundaries is really important and sticking to them. Amazing. I'm going to hand it back to Michelle for a couple of closing okay. words. Yeah, no, this has been such an amazing discussion. Um, I can't thank you enough for being part of this panel. And I am confident that everyone in the audience was able to take something away from this discussion. So, and that's, that's the best kind of discussion when you can leave actually feeling like you can implement something in your life. And um, yeah, so my sincere thank you to all, to all of you. And um, yeah, I'm just very happy. I will pass it over to Sonia now for our next, uh, next portion. Thank you so much, Michelle, for your outstanding leadership and to all our panelists. I have the privilege of working with each of you in different ways. Thank you for the inspirational discussion. This is the time when all of the parents who might like to put their children in front of the infotainment with little rays and all of the critters that they are going to be learning about, that is beginning now. So just in case you haven't taken that opportunity, drop something into the chat if you need any assistance. 
It is now my great pleasure to introduce a wonderful friend to our entrepreneurship community to Invest Ottawa and Bayview Yards, Naomi Morisawa Dekoven, Managing Lawyer of MDK Business Law, who is going to introduce our keynote speakers. She is an amazing champion for entrepreneurship. She is deeply engaged with us at Invest Ottawa, serving as one of our sponsors for our pre-accelerator program. And I know we are bringing her forward. It looks like, Naomi, your camera might be giving you, there we go, wonderful. Welcome to our virtual stage. I'm giving you our virtual mic. Awesome, thank you very much, Sonia. And, uh, you know, technical difficulties in this time, we have to adapt, but. <laughs> Thank you uh, for your kind remarks and thanks to Invest Ottawa and the entire team, allies and supporters for assembling such a awesome, rich array of programming for this year's International Women's Week. I'm so excited to be participating in today's F Factor program along with all of you. Uh, I think you'll agree that today's panel discussion with their four very strong, courageous women was very refreshing, honest, and energizing. Um, so based on uh, our law firm's work over the last few decades with entrepreneurs and our uh, regular interaction with pre-accelerator, accelerator, and digital main street businesses at Invest Ottawa, I can certainly attest that we've had, um, we have so many amazing high potential startups and other innovative businesses founded by women founders within our Ottawa community. Um, and I think in Ottawa, Sonia, there's only really one or two degrees of separation between those of us in the business community. So, you know, in my mind, it's really critical that all of us who are in a position to do so bring our best focus, skills, energy, and resources to helping women owned businesses launch, grow, and thrive long term. So one of the challenges, as you've heard earlier from Jennifer and Julia, has been raising capital. And it's always been a challenge for you know founders in general, but in particular, we found over the last year for many women founders and business owners. And it's for this reason in particular, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our keynote speaker, Mandela Schumacher Hodge Dixon. She's the founder and CEO of Founder uh, Gym, the premier online training program for underrepresented founders. So Mandela, you're out there, I know, but you're a founder, investor, and startup ecosystem leader, and what an impact you've had. You've trained hundreds of entrepreneurs around the world on how to build successful businesses, and you and your team have helped over 500 founders raise more than U.S., 80 million in startup capital in less than three years. So, you know, welcome to Ottawa, welcome to uh, Mandela, and, and thank you in advance for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, that's it for me. I'm going to pass the virtual mic back to Shah, and you can begin the virtual fireside chat. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Naomi. Mandela, I am so excited to be sitting down to talk with you today. I selfishly wish this could be in person and we could be in front of a crowd and an audience in Ottawa, but here we are virtually. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh my goodness, I'm excited too. Always happy to see a familiar face and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Naomi, and thanks for having me. Community Invest Ottawa, I'm super excited to be here. Amazing. So before we get into the dropping gems portion of our conversation, I have had the pleasure and honor of getting to know you over the years through the work that we've done at Shopify with Afrotech and having you come in to facilitate some of those Build Black conversations. But for those of you who are not familiar with you and with your work and maybe with your journey to starting Founders Gym, could you give us just like a little bit of insights into who you are and how you came to creating the amazing work and doing the amazing work that you're doing at Founders Gym? 
Yeah. So I'll start off by saying it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> my <laughs> life has been a lot of accidents that I've kind of continued to just tap into my intuition and my heart and said, I think this is the best next step for me. So let's go for it. Um, my background, you know, is at the intersection of social justice, sports, education, and entrepreneurship. And so when you learn what Founder Gym is, you will understand why it is the way it is, because it's kind of taken different parts of my experiences up to this point and tried to mesh it all together into this training program for underrepresented founders, women, black founders, Latinx founders, indigenous founders, LGBTQIA founder, veteran founders, just anyone who comes from a non-traditional background who historically has been left out of the opportunity to navigate and utilize venture capital as a tool to scale um, businesses. But yeah, I used to, prior to coming to Silicon Valley, I was a sixth grade teacher. Um, I ended up uh, being in South Central Los Angeles, one of the poorest um, communities in all of Los Angeles. It's also one of the second largest school district in the United States after New York. Um, so that experience really grounded me as an educator. And then I went and got my master's in education. I started my PhD in education. And then I ended up dropping out because I bumped into something called entrepreneurship. And that was back in 2011. I fell head over heels, Shav, in love. Like I had never just been in an environment where um, it wasn't just about theorizing change. It was actually rolling up your sleeves and doing something real time with people with complementary skill sets. So there's many more parts of like my background that I can tell you about, but I think I'm going to stop there. Okay, we can get into it. And I just want to remind folks who are tuning in, if you have any questions for Mandela as we go to please pop them in into the Q&A section and we'll make sure to create some space towards the end of the session for those questions. So, you know, I'm curious without giving us all of the caramel secret, but I'm interested to know like, what makes the biggest difference for the founders that you serve, right? Like what can we do here in Ottawa, Ontario, in Canada to learn from, from, from your experience working with underrepresented founders? What, yeah. what should we be doing? Yeah, so it's an important question. I think one of the things that I will ground my answer in is that when I, I worked at a venture capital firm prior to launching Founder Gym, it was called Cape Four Capital, and it's one of the more progressive VC firms in the industry. And there I co-launched the first ever diversity and inclusion pledge, working with venture capitalists to help their portfolio companies bake diversity and inclusion and equity into the DNA of early stage tech startups. And so that's another, I think, important piece as I answer the question about like what learnings have I gleaned, not just from Founder Gym, but other projects that I've had. And I think one of the biggest things is just really understanding your target user. It's kind of like going back to the basics of startups and eating your own dog food and that rather than creating a solution, the first thing to do is to really understand the people who are experiencing the problem. And I think oftentimes people apply the same philosophies and frameworks like lean startup methodology or just go read Venture Unlocked or just go listen to this podcast and, and it'll apply to you. When in reality, there's so many nuances that are misunderstood or not understood about the experience of being an underrepresented founder, a first, a only, a one of a few. And so I think one of the biggest things that I could impart as advice upon other people who really want to make a difference in the lives of underrepresented entrepreneurs is take the time to interview them, listen to them, really have a strong data set before you go and devise your solution. So before I did Founder Gym, I interviewed hundreds upon hundreds of founders, not just venture back founders, but small business owners, hobbyists, like people all on different ends of the spectrum of business acumen. And it really helped me get clear on who the avatar was that I was going to try to service. And then the next thing is, all right, now I'm going to run an experiment and try to figure out, right, like how to solve the problem. There were so many problems, Shav, so, so, so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, to get narrow in and focus on one problem that you want to solve and be the best in the world at. So the bet I made was on fundraising. And I felt that if I could really teach underrepresented founders how to navigate fundraising, then that could not only give them the capital that so many of them needed but didn't have to get started or to even scale, but it also came along with a network. 
It comes along with insider information. It comes along with branding and cachet. So it's like really this cheat code that a lot of people fully don't understand. And I felt like if I could really level up underrepresented founders in this one area, it would put them all in a better position to get better at go-to-market strategy, at scaling, at hiring, at a promotion, right? All the other aspects of business. So I think the second thing, if you want to work with underrepresented founders is pick one area to really focus on first and do your best to, to run experiments to figure out what's working, what's not. But I think the problem people run into is they're testing too many variables at the same yeah. time. They're trying to help them with this and that and this and that. And it's kind of like not all of them are equally important. So I would just narrow in. And then I think a third thing is around um, is around structure and accountability. So I told you, Shaw, that um, I did mention, I think sports is a part of my background, but it's a huge part of who I am. I was actually a division one college athlete um, in the United States playing soccer and I was the captain of the team. And so sports psychology is really big to me. And I believe your mind is a muscle and I believe you can work that mind out to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And so a lot of what we also infuse in Founder Gym is elements of sports psychology and that even though you may not be the championship level performer in this area conditioning to the mind to start believing you can visualizing you can um and then uh, the last thing is accountability you know one of my favorite quotes um i don't know who said it so if someone knows feel free to speak up but one of my favorite quotes is like if information alone were the answer we would all be millionaires with six packs yeah. <laughs> like information's yep. out there. It's out there, right? I can Google how to raise capital, right? If that was it, like we could all just follow that and be good. But it takes more than that. And I think that one of the things also is don't underestimate the importance of setting up accountability structures to get people to move, to get people to improve. Like I think back to my teaching days in the sixth grade classroom of just the checks and balances you need to have in place, right? Every week to help the students move and progress in the curriculum week over week, month over month, semester over semester. And I think those structures still work for adults. Yeah, and, and we've had this conversation, maybe we had this conversation as early as a couple of weeks ago about the importance of community and community building. As a new entrepreneur, new to this space, there are so often times where I feel very alone in, in, in this, where I'm just like, this must be only me who's experiencing this specific challenge. And half the time, you know, I, I talk myself out of moving forward. So would you be open to just discussing the importance of like community for entrepreneurship and for entrepreneurs? I'm so glad you touched upon that shop. So yeah, community is incredibly important. It actually was the thing I probably underestimated the most when I started Founder Gym is I just, you know, people come to Founder Gym oftentimes for very individualistic reasons. Like yeah. they're like, I just want to raise, like, I'm going to go to this program and you're going to teach me how to raise. And it's going to be all great. My company's going to be successful. I'm going to be on TechCrunch. Great. But I think that what people soon realize is the importance of the community. They stay for the community and they keep coming back because one of the things I didn't fully understand that I definitely understand now, this is our fourth year going into Founder Gym, is the importance of being around people who are highly ambitious, high performing and want to win, but also have those shared obstacles that you have. They experience the, the same biases that you do, the same stereotypes they're trying to navigate as they enter this world that's predominantly dominated by white men. And so I think be, having other people who are also mm. pioneers and going down this path for the first time is really important for morale and a, important for a sense of belonging because these really are the outliers of their communities, right? Mm -hmm. Their communities maybe have historically just been employees, right? And for the first time, they're really venturing out and going out and building a business and trying to build it at scale. And it's really scary. And sometimes even the people in your own commun physical community don't support you. They don't understand. And so just to be around other people is so important. And I do think you can do intentional things to build a culture of inclusivity and belonging. So we have something called the Founder Gym Pledge. We have a motto called We All Go Up Together. So a lot of what we do when we train our founders, it's not about the individual succeeding. It's about all of us going up together. And if you don't have that ethos from the beginning, again, it's really hard to set that standard. Absolutely. 
Thank you. That's such good information for us to be able to take back and leverage. And I, I want to talk a little bit about um, tech founders, uh, founders of tech enabled businesses. And, and I'd love to dig into like what works uh, when we are striving to help support underrepresented founders in that specific um, pillar when it comes to like tech and tech enabled businesses. Do you have any recommendations, any suggestions? Yeah. And maybe we touch a little bit about the impact on the on the uh, the impact of the pandemic and approaches that you're you're adopting to help support those founders. Yeah, good questions. I think that um, tech businesses, tech enabled business, the power, the key word is tech, right? Mm -hmm. Tech is the special sauce that allows you to reach more people faster than you otherwise could. And I think the same way we're trying to close the educational gap when it comes to raising capital and how to use the capital to scale, there also is a huge gap in understanding of technology and tech stacks and just what's available like companies like shopify have allowed everybody to instantly have a store online right it's just like if you think about this just like 10 15 years ago it's like mind-boggling what yeah. someone would have to do to start an online store right and so there's so much technology at our fingertips now that really allow more people than ever to become overnight entrepreneurs right and to really monetize their passions so I do think there's a gap there. And one of the things is, right, like what type of programming can be used to service them and understanding their technology options at their disposal? Is it something like you're trying to build that you need a CTO for, a chief technical officer? Or is there a platform that you could just plug into and use, right? And I think that knowledge base too has room for improving. Um, in terms of the pandemic, so the pandemic rocked everybody, <laughs> everybody, rock me too. I said, oh, snap. <laughs> You know, and I, 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 I have, um, I am very well connected in Silicon Valley. And so one of the first things I did when the pandemic hit is I called up a lot of my friends who are like partners at firms and, you know, um, very successful funded founders. And I had them get on a live like Zoom, such as this, so they could talk to our community and let them know real time what's going on. Like people were kind of looking for the figurehead to calm them down because everyone was kind of freaking out. And um, one of the things I think the pandemic taught me and that taught a lot of the founders is that nothing's guaranteed. Like the only thing guaranteed is change. And whether the next thing we'll run into is a pandemic or something else, the reality is, is that life, it can be unpredictable, no matter how bulletproof you think your business plan is, or your executive summary, your pitch deck, like ish happens. Yep. And I think part of that is just grounding you in fundamental business skills, right? About how, again, let's go back to the basics. Pay attention to the people and what's going on for the people and how you can best service them. Because at the bare bones, a business is just a product or a service that solves someone else's problems yes. to the degree that they're willing to pay for it. That's it, right? So if, if again, you can pay attention to see what people's problems are, right? At the start of the pandemic, people had problems accessing hand sanitizer, accessing masks, right? Accessing certain toilet paper and food. I mean, it got so out of control in so many ways or accessing food. I mean, all sorts of things. And so... I think paying attention to what's happening with the people is a pandemic proof skill. And yeah, I yeah. personally believe in the reason I got into the business of helping entrepreneurs is because I don't believe that entrepreneurship is just this fun, frilly mode of expression. I think it's yes, that, but I also think, Shab, it's a survival skill. Yes. Fundamentally, it's a survival skill. If you can turn a dime into a dollar in any market conditions, you good. You good, right? No matter what happens. And I think that um, that's just one of the things we honed in on. So we actually launched a new program called the Money Magnet Program, yes. really helping people how to not just capitalize your business using venture capital, but how to capitalize your business using other streams of income and specifically revenue. Awesome. Thank you. And I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about, I know that Founder Jim, you're based, you know, out in Silicon Valley, out in, you know, Cali, but what type of experiences have you had in Canada with Canadian founders? Because we know that Founder Jim is active in other regions outside of just the States. 
Yeah. So we've been fortunate enough in that we've had a lot of inbound interest from founders around the world. And so we actually now as of our last cohort, it, the graduation is coming out, graduation articles coming out tomorrow. So we have founders represented in 25 countries now across six continents. And one of them is Canada. So we actually have two founders in particular over the last couple of cohorts. Christina is one who you've been in contact with. Yes. Christina was actually, Christina Flynn identifies as LGBTQ woman. She's based in Toronto, but she is a very high performing founder. And as she was in a transition period for her um, own business, I saw the writing on the wall and I'm like, well, you are a really great leader and I would love for you to come work for Founder Gym. So fortunately, she said yes, and she officially joined our team in December. So we actually have our first Canadian team member Ooh. on Team Founder Gym, which I'm excited about. It's our first international team member. Yes, yeah, she is awesome, Sonia. Um, and then we also have Natik. Natik was a founder in one of our early cohorts, and he actually pivoted to a different company after Founder Gym, and that company is called MemberStack. And they actually were admitted into Y Combinator, one of the premier accelerator programs out here. And um, He's another force to be reckoned with. So I think the thing that we've been able to do is because we've always been 100% virtual, we've yep. been able to service founders from all over the world and even help people build bridges, entrepreneurial bridges to different parts. So I think one of the coolest things is just seeing the collaborative nature mm -hmm. of these businesses. So if it's a, a business based in Atlanta, Georgia, and they're trying to expand into Canada, right? We have founders in the community who can help get them educated and up to speed about the uh, Canadian ecosystem, where they may want want to talk to people. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited to do more. And I think with Christina on our team, we're going to be doing a lot more. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, we have a lot of people, you know, watching, tuning in. So I have a couple of questions for you. So the first one is what guidance would you have for as aspiring or current angel investors in our region? And then the second question will kind of go into your experiences as an entrepreneur navigating, navigating COVID and any advice you might have for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs. But let's start with angel investors, potential angel investors. All right. So angel <laughs> investors, if you're on, if you're on, up. you are so important. Like, I don't know if anyone's told you that recently, but I'm here to as your as your lovely fairy god founder to remind you that you are so important to the ecosystem, specifically to underrepresented to specifically to underrepresented founders. And the reason is is because you're an angel investor because you are investing your own capital. More than likely, sometimes angel investors run a syndicate and they group angel investors' money together and pull that into companies. But for the most part, an angel investor is someone who uses their own capital to deploy into private companies versus a venture capitalist is more so a professional investor who uses money from LPs, limited partners. And so angel investors are so important because you all, we need you to be angels. We need you to dream alongside founders, founders who don't fit the mold, founders who come from untraditional backgrounds, who may be written off, right? If they just use the typical venture backable list. And I just think that angel investors are incredibly important um, because you're not, it's one thing to give your money, which they definitely need. They need your money. So give the money, but they also need your warm intros. They need your mentorship. They need your branding. They need your cachet, right? I think another thing I would also encourage angel investors is don't stop with the wire do more than just wire the funds, right? Really see how you can support and help fill in the gaps that the founders may need because when you're investing, it's really at the baby stage of the company. They're just learning how to walk and how to grow up. And so just thinking about your network and maybe you don't have the particular expertise, but maybe someone in your network does. Because usually if you're an angel investor, you've done pretty well for yourself in your career. And so, you know, why not maybe open up some of your Rolodex and letting certain select founders have more access to that so that that they can advance better. But angel investors are so important. And I would say the last thing is make yourself known, like make it easier for people to find you. And I think you can do this by literally, if you have certain focus areas of the season or the year, and you want to focus on women founders or black founders or a certain sector, put that on your LinkedIn, right? Put that on your Twitter, because we actually teach founders in our program how to search for you. And so I'm asking you to make it easier for us to find you. Amazing. And I was going to ask you that question of like, 
if somebody's thinking about becoming an angel investor, you know, it could be really intimidating, intimidating to know where to start. So I'll be saying, I'm asking for a friend, that friend might be me, but if we are thinking, or if somebody is thinking or has that kind of like, you know, that little seed, what are some things that we should be considering? Is there a certain amount of money we should be prepared to invest? Like, yeah. Yeah, such a good question. So I'm an angel investor as well. So I can talk from, again, my experience. And then there's also something called a scout program, which I just want to plug really quickly because angel investing is like you're investing your own capital. Checks can be as small as a couple thousand dollars. They can also go bigger to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. Again, depending on your disposable income. But even a small check, again, it matters because it's not just about the money. It's the vote of confidence. It's your support. It's your, you know... um, um, it's it's everything else that I already mentioned. Yeah. But what I'll say about a scout program is a scout program is basically like a partnership with a venture capital firm and you are playing like an angel investor, but rather than investing your own capital, you're investing capital provided by the venture capital firm. So I strongly recommend, I don't know if there's scout programs out there, different firms, they're definitely in the United States. Um, and I know they have representatives in Canada, but um, it's a great way to be an angel investor without putting your own capital out out there and you actually do make a portion of the returns right because investing is also about making money you want to ROI on your investment right it's not just about philanthropy and doing good this is about making money right so I want to be clear about that and so there's scout programs you should look into light speed um, capital you should look into Sequoia capital you should look into there's a bunch I, I, w- I could get you a list after okay. but then when I say of angel training programs Harlem Capital just launched a new angel uh, training program first round capital has a training program that I was in I was in their first inaugural batch um there's more, there's other ones too. Um, there's Hello Angels, there's All Rays, I believe has an investor angel program. But um, really the only thing, uh, again, that you need to start is you do need the capital. So either you have the capital or you're going to partner with a VC firm that has the capital. Amazing. Thank you for that advice. I'm taking those mental notes and I hope that this is recorded so I can go back and make sure I captured everything. I that you. We can talk after this too. Perfect. I love it. And, and like, what's one piece of advice that you can offer to entrepreneurs and founders who are trying to navigate the pandemic? And let's like talk about this specifically from the angle of like trying to lock in investment. Yeah. Navigating the pandemic. So I think just addressing the elephant in the room that if you are For instance, if you're trying to launch an in-person school, right? Of course, we are still navigating a pandemic, right? The vaccine is still being rolled out, right? Probably a little too slowly. And the reality is the investors are gonna wanna know, well, how does this address like what's going on, right? With safety protocols. And so I think not bearing that information and being upfront with, again, if you are building a product or service that will kind of conflict with the state of affairs right now with the pandemic, you need to be upfront about not only how are you gonna be successful during the pandemic, but once the pandemic is over, how do you thrive? Is this like a thing that's only gonna be wanted during the pandemic or is this gonna be a thing that's wanted for another five, 10 years, right? And usually the lifeline of a venture-backed tech startup, the ideal lifeline is between five to 15 years, right? The ending of a a venture-backed startup is the finish line is a liquidity event, which basically means either the company sells to a larger company. So when Instagram sold to Facebook or when LinkedIn sold to Microsoft or WhatsApp sold to Facebook, or there's an IPO, right? You go public Mm -hmm. on the stock market and like DoorDash and Airbnb just IPO'd last December, right? But there needs to be a liquidity event for an investor to really make the money that they're expecting to, and even for the founders and early employees to to see the fruits of their labor in terms of money too. Amazing. And I will just remind folks, if you have any questions for Mandela, pop them into the q and I'm going to ask one more question and then maybe we can go to an audience question and then we can come back to some of these questions. Just want to make it as interactive as possible. But, you know, you're an entrepreneur yourself. You, 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 you've, you've spoken to that. Won you over, you fell head over heels for entrepreneurship. So what are some of the greatest surprises that you've had along your own entrepreneurship journey? And then, you know, you're also dealing and engaging with hundreds of entrepreneurs, um, what are some of the biggest surprises that you've, you've, you've seen through your program and through the entrepreneurs who are coming through your program? 
Yeah, I would say uh, pretending that you have it all together <laughs> is not a winning strategy. <laughs> So I think that one of the biggest lessons I learned, again, I was very much a first. I didn't know anyone, like when I navigated into the space in 2011, I didn't know, I didn't know what Silicon Valley was. I didn't understand it. I had never taken a tech, business, finance, entrepreneurship class in my life. Um, I didn't know anyone. And so I think that there was def definitely imposter syndrome, yes. which is a sense of feeling like I don't belong here, but then also having to put on like I do belong here. And I think in many ways I overcompensated and I wasn't as vulnerable as I needed to be, especially with my investors to get the help that I needed. And this is one of the biggest things that we work on with underrepresented founders and founder gym is just how how do you balance that level of credibility and authority and respect, right? With the other people you'll be coming into contact with, but also how do you let your guard down as well and let them know, this is what I know. This is what I don't know. Can you help me? Um, because the people on the other side are experts. They see many companies more than just you, and they can take the wide view of everything going on in their historical database of their head and the market um, and the resources they have at their disposal to help you be successful. So by and large, Rob, the biggest mistake I learned like, aha, was girl, you ain't gonna do this by yourself, so ask for help. <laughs> so ask for help, okay? Closed mouths don't get fed. So that was number one. I would say, Oops. Okay. So let's do this. Do you hear me? Now I can hear you. I saw, I saw the energy. I felt the vibes. So maybe we can just rewind like 20 seconds uh, <laughs> and, and start from there. I think you were like saying that you can't do this by yourself. It's okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where, you know, technology, okay, okay. Is great. Okay. Yeah. All good. All good. We're back. We're back. Listen, everything back. Gotta work. So <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, you're not going to win by yourself. I don't care what position you're playing in the field. You're just not going to win by yourself. Success is a team sport. So just accept it and start getting people on your team to help. I think the other thing um, that I was saying is uh, even a more recent revelation than others is just how I've tried to navigate being a business owner, being a leader in the ecosystem, but also being um, a wife and a mother and a friend and a daughter. And, you know, it, it's so many hats. And I feel like, you know, one thing is that in year one of Founder Gym, I had just gotten married. In year two of Founder Gym, I got pregnant. In year three of Founder Gym, I was raising an infant, right? And year four of Founder Gym, y'all about to find out what's about to happen next, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like balancing all the different roles I want to play and just making sure I stay grounded in what's most important to me has been challenging, but it's one of the most important things to me. And I think that my advice for everyone is just at the end of the day, what actually matters for you and making sure your calendar matches what matters to you is important. And so a book I oftentimes reference is called Essentialism, and it's really helped ground me in making bold no's to a lot of people so I can say big yeses to the things that matter most to me. I love that. Say bold no's so you can say those big yeses. That's definitely something I think uh, that I grapple with, and I feel like all people who are entrepreneurs or founders and also having, you know, your full-time job and all the other things that you do. It's just like saying that intentional no to make space for the yes. I have a couple of questions from the audience. So the first one I'm going to post to you is from Talia, Jesse. And the question is, how do you pivot when a plan does not go as expected? 
So life, yes. Yes. Oh, the pivot, the pivot. Um, there's also another word. What do they call it? It's not a pivot. They say it's like a hard turn, like a U-turn. <laughs> uh, and then there's just kind of like a slight iteration. So I think yeah. just knowing that there's multiple degrees you can go, or you can do a U-turn, you could stop and get off of that track. So, but in any case, a pivot is just the sense of what you've been doing isn't working or your original hypothesis hasn't proved correct. And I think just stopping and using that language can be really helpful because it takes the personal sting out of it, right? Yeah. As an entrepreneur, you're a scientist. You're just experimenting. You ran an experiment. You used the data you had at the time, right, to generate the hypothesis. You used the team and the resources you had to test it, and ah, it didn't work out, right? That's a part of entrepreneurship. So just, I think, loving yourself regardless is very important because you're going to need to have the wherewithal and the confidence to persevere. So. In terms of pivoting, I think really doing a postmortem is the most important thing of really stopping and looking at why things went wrong, why your hypothesis didn't work out and deconstructing the lack of success so that you can find the lessons and make sure you learn the lessons before launching to your next thing. I think sometimes, especially when we're in a moment of chaos, we can feel the urge and the need to just do the next thing quickly without really taking the time to let the lessons sink in. Um, so I would just say create space for yourself first to make sure you've learned the lessons and that you're really building your next venture, your next pivot from a place of grounded in a deeper understanding about how business works. Um, and I would say the other thing too, is that you're going to fail your way to success. So all because you pivot this one time and you try the next thing doesn't mean it's going to work out perfectly either. I think one of the things that's hardest about business is that it is constantly changing because people are changing, culture is changing, be human behaviors are changing, the market is changing. And so even like Founder Gym, I launched Founder Gym in 2017, way before the pandemic was even part of my consciousness. Yeah. Now, right, there's so many online this, online that. Back in the day, it was like, oh, what you're doing, Mandela is so revolutionary. Now it's just like everybody's doing it. So it's just the reality that I'm operating in a new market now, right? So even with Founder Gym, it's like, how do you represent the specialness of what you're doing as the market changes? So mm -hmm. I think accepting that being agile and uh, being agile and willing to change is par for this course. It's just a part of it. And I, yeah, I think you're going to pivot your way to success. So good luck. Amazing. Okay. A question from Naomi. Mandela, how are you finding that generally investors appreciate a founder who pitches and openly admits that she doesn't have all the answers or that they don't have all the answers? Yeah, I think it's really important to establish your authority, right? I think people listen to you differently when they respect yeah. you. So the most important thing that we teach founders up front is to flex. We call it flexing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really is about, okay, using your lived experience, the brands you're associated with, the logos, the years of whatever work you have in a certain field to establish the respect up front. Because if you don't do that, they're going to be listening to your whole pitch without really necessarily respecting you, the leader and the person. So I definitely believe in establishing your authority out up front. So for instance, even look at this interview, right? Shav asked me up front, Mandela, tell me about yourself, right? That was my opportunity to let you all know who the hell I am and what I've been up to. So maybe you'll listen to me differently, right? If I hadn't done that, right, maybe you wouldn't have listened to me the same. So I think establishing your authority authority up front is always very important. Now you're going to take them through your experiment. You're going to say, this is the problem. This is our solution. This is our traction. This is the market size. This is the team. This is how much we're raising, right? You go through your whole spiel. And I don't think you need to volunteer that you don't know what you don't know. But I yeah. do think as you get into the line of questioning and the investors are asking you questions, it's okay to tell the truth. Right. Yeah. Tell the truth in a way, right, that supports your hypothesis, right? You want to elevate the data that supports your hypothesis. Otherwise, it probably shouldn't be your hypothesis. Mm -hmm. But I think about the things that you are unsure of. I think having an answer to how you're thinking about filling in those gaps is important right? Because you may not know the answer, but really what they're assessing for is your willingness to think it through. 
Hmm. Did you even think through the possible scenarios of what it could be, right? Because then that shows them that this person's a thinker, they're willing to problem solve because they understand that this whole business is going to be 10 to 15 years of problem solving. <laughs> and they want to see that there's evidence that you understand that there is a problem and that you're thinking through the solution doesn't mean you have to have the perfect solution. But I more so believe that many investors are not assessing for the perfection of your business today, but for how you're problem solving along the way. Amazing. I'm catching these gems. I'm collecting them and I'm keeping them. We got another question from Kelsey and Kelsey says, Mandela, thank you for sharing your experience and advice for us. Has being grounded and self-aware in the moment come natural to you? Or has that been a muscle that you've worked on? And the second part of that is if it is more natural to you, do you have any tips on resetting in the moment to get grounded when the going gets tough? Ooh, grounded and self-aware in the moment. Yes, I appreciate that because that is something I intentionally work on, right? Like I... Um, I have been navigating my life as an entrepreneur. It'll be my 10th year this summer, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's important to have perspective of just my distance travel and how long I've been doing this. I think another thing too, though, is, um, is something that's really important to me, which is a mission statement, a personal mm -hmm. mission statement. I actually believe that before you build a business mission statement, you should have a personal mission statement that really grounds you in who you are, what you're up to in this lifetime and the legacy you want to leave behind. Once you have that squared away, then it's about, well, what business fits into that? What business serves that, right? Versus the reverse of maybe looking out into the ecosystem, trying to find an opportunity, squeezing yourself into it. And it's not really who you are. So for me, being able to be my authentic self, my whole self is very important. I think it's one of the perks of being an entrepreneur, because rather than me having to fit myself and contort myself into someone else's box, right? I'm like, no, Founder Jim is me. I'm here. I could spread my wings as far as I want to go. And so I think that what's grounded me is knowing who I am and what I'm up to in this lifetime. And I'm very well versed on how Founder Jim is connected to that. So when I show up, right, it's not me code switching. It's not me pretending to be somebody I'm not for this moment. It's just all aligned. And I think alignment really creates calmness when you're more aligned. Um, and then I would say the, the daily rituals, right? I write in my journal daily. I wake up and I write down what I'm grateful for. I write down what my intention is for the day. I read a lot of personal development books. Like I think that your business will get better when you get better right? As the leader. And so I go to work on myself on a regular basis. And then I think the last thing is just reps. I have a lot of reps under my belt. I, I, I've, I've, I've bombed a bunch of things in my life. <laughs> Right, I bombed a bunch of things, but I think that because I've been through it and I know that I will recover and that it'll be okay, um, it's just given me confidence. So I think just repetition and the only way to have that is to just, just get started. Yeah, I have a question, curious, are there any, like, I love books, I love reading. It's really difficult for me to find the time or the cognitive bandwidth to do that these days. But I, what I do do is I walk the dog every day for an hour and I'm open to listening to books. But do you have any podcasts that like you kind of are your go-to podcasts that you listen to to get like, you know, some of those insights and those knowledges, maybe like both from the personal perspective, like the personal growth side and then like the business perspective side? Good question. So I, I don't think I've listened to any like personal development podcasts. Someone I do appreciate is Jay Shetty and I more so follow him on his Instagram, but I really like his content. I love Red Table Talk. I yeah. love, um, but the, I would say personal development more so is in my audio books. So I'm just mm -hmm. saying listen. Um, so my go-to like I'm really listening to right now is The Alchemist, The mm -hmm. Four Agreements, um, a new earth awakening to your life's purpose. Um, the game of life by Florence Goebel Shin. Um, seven habits of highly effective people, how to win friends and influence people. 
Um, I'm looking over my bookshelf right it's now. It's all good. It's all good. I love autobiographies, <laughs> Michelle Obama, Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela. Uh, who else was I reading the other day? Booker T. Washington. I really like like studying human nature and people, but I also love seeing the, the journeys of other people. And so I really like biographies, autobiographies, because it grounds me in that every everybody's journey is hard. Everybody has felt moments when they wanted to quit, when they wanted to throw in the towel. And so it just helps me stay like, okay, I, I'm not out of my mind, right? This is just hard for everybody, even the most powerful people in the world. Um, but I would say on the business side, I've listened to some podcasts like um, Reed Hoffman has one. I think it's uh, Masters of Scale. Yep. Obviously there's Guy Raz at NPR, um, How I Built This. I was on one of his episodes. I think, um, what else do I listen to? Um, Ba, ba, ba. I don't know. Maybe I'm so busy building businesses and helping. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, I'll do my own podcast. I don't know. But the personal development, I think, is more where I, I do my homework. <laughs> Absolutely. And another, I have I have a question for you, but another question. Um, we'd love to hear about the best pitch, pitches you have seen in your work with Founder Jim and what made them amazing and memorable for you. Oh, best pitches. Um I think that pitches that follow a flow, but have people's own sauce on it is important. Like, I think sometimes people don't believe when investors say like, these are the things I want to see in the deck. It's actually true. These are the things I want to see in the deck. And I think that sometimes people take it as optional, mm -hmm. but I really recommend like, again, starting with the problem, the solution, going to the traction and the market size and like paint a picture, how big this can get. Tell me the team, right? Yeah. There's a flow to it because that is the norm of this culture called venture capital. And I think just like if I were to travel to Ottawa, right, hopefully <laughs> next year, right, everything back to normal and I get the opportunity to travel out there, right? Like I'm going to do my homework before I get out there, right? Like, what are some of the appropriate cultures and norms, right? Is French mostly spoken or is English mostly spoken, right? Like, I'm going to do my homework. And I think just taking the time to really um, take a second and, and, and understand what is the culture of the country called venture capital mm -hmm. is important. And I totally forgot what your question was. It was okay. It was okay. Just like, what are some of the, um, what makes a good pitch amazing? What makes a good pitch? Okay. Like oh yeah, some of the best pitches I've seen. Okay, so yeah. I said within the template that I've kind of given you, I think some of the best pitches are where you can really, again, um, build a bridge in the investor's mind of like who you are and why you're the one to do this. I think sometimes people really underestimate how important your founder pitch is. Not your company, but you as the founder, like why you? Of all the people in the world, why are you the one that can do this when all the other people couldn't? And I think that one of the things I've noticed with women founders or underrepresented founders is they undersell themselves. They don't have, they don't always lead with just the authority stats. This is what it is. This is who I am. And it's kind of downplayed or not shared at all. And that's one of the things we overtly explicitly work on with founders is how to sell themselves, not from a place of desperation, from a yep. place of confidence of knowing. Um, so that's a, a really big Big thing and I think it's a difference between pitching and like selling versus like your storytelling like mm -hmm. hi my name is Mandela I'm the founder of Founder Gym we're the online training center for underrepresented founders this is what we've accomplished so far I'm raising this amount let me know if you're interested right yeah. it's a it's a it's a it's a different energy that you're that you're putting off when you are desperate versus when you know that you are going to be successful and you are inviting someone else to be a business partner into the opportunity, it comes off different. So I think that part of this is, again, people may say, well, I don't feel confident and it. It really does take a bit of practice, but I also think it takes grounding yourself in who you are. So one of the tips I wanna give everybody that I gave, I give to all the Founder Gym members is your receipt box. A receipt box is like a, uh, it doesn't have to be something that's real and physical. It can be, it could be a Google doc. It could be a notion form. I don't care what it is, but the receipt box is a historical record of mm -hmm. your achievements, things that you've done that most other people can't do. 
Things that you've done that most other people would say are impossible. Things that you've done that you almost didn't think you could do, but you did. And that, that historical record is so important because there will be doubts. There will be areas of lack of confidence. And you need to be able to reference that receipt box and open it back up to remind you who you are and what you're capable and the courage and capabilities that have always been inside of you. And so I think just having some of these tools and um, structures in place to catch you when you fall in addition to community is yeah. so important to really not just knowing you need to come off as confident, but actually being confident. Awesome. Yes. I love that idea of a receipt box. I'm going to get my Sharpie. I'm going to get my post-its and I'm going to actually make physical ones. I have a, a question like in this COVID world, where does the money reside? Like where are people who want to invest in businesses and entrepreneurs? Are they in the same places? Like has anything changed? Should, pe should people be getting on uh, what's that new platform that everybody's uh, in? It's not Instagram. Clubhouse? Yeah, Clubhouse. Should people be getting on Clubhouse? Is that where they can find folks oh who want like, where goodness. does it come from? Has it changed? Is it the same? Yeah, so you're saying for people like founders? For or founders, for founders. founders. Yeah, I listen, there has, I have never seen anything like what I'm seeing nowadays in terms of like people raising their hands and say, I want to be a founder, but also on the other end, people raising their hands and say, I want to be an investor. Like there has just never been such focus and I would say mainstream activity um, in this realm of venture capital. I think historically venture capital was like an old man's club and it was run by the same old people and the same old lineage who built the same old companies. And now it's kind of, like I said, become mainstream. And with that, it's come new audiences and interests. And I actually think that, and not saying it's perfect, it is far, 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 far from perfect because let me give you the stats. Less than 1% uh, less than of all venture capital goes to black founders. Less than 1%. Less than 2% of all venture capital goes to Latinx founders. Less than 13% um, goes to women founders. Um, but that's even women founders who have male co-founders. So the reality is it's still not great at all. But there, even with that said, there has never been more capital being deployed for underrepresented founders that I've ever seen than in now than in the last 10 years. So it is still promising. It's hopeful. It's not where it needs to be, but it is promising. So what I would say is that I definitely think that getting on platforms like Clubhouse, for sure, it definitely started with the investor community. So there's tons of investors giving away free content all day long, even founders. I know of pitch rooms where you can just go on there and practice your pitch and get feedback, right? So there's so many more tools at your disposal than ever before and ways to build community. But I would even say Twitter is still one of the go-to places of where founders and investors connect. So my advice for you, and I tell people too, you need to dust off your chops with cyber stalking in a safe way. I'm not talking about like the weird way. I'm talking about safe way, but yeah. cyber stalking and like literally those investors that you're trying to get access to, go follow them everywhere. Literally read what they're posting. Try to find realms of realms of connectivity between you and them. Because even though I didn't go to Stanford, I didn't have an uncle who worked in venture capital, right? Maybe, right, there's a connection that I'm a capoeirista, right? And maybe this investor does jujitsu, right? And maybe that's a way for me to build a bridge of connection and rapport. So I think, again, it's about how can you build bridges where they're seemingly seem not to be not. Mm, I love that. Okay. Clubhouse going to get on that. Uh, I'm cognizant of the time, uh, but I do just have one more question that I just love to, to ask you quickly for us as an ecosystem in the Ottawa region at Invest Ottawa Baby Yards for our partners, people who are in our community, what can we do to drive this DAO forward uh, more impactfully during and beyond the, the pandemic? And when I say drive the DAO forward, I mean supporting underrepresented and underserved entrepreneurs who are in our ecosystems. Yeah, I think you know, one of the things that may seem obvious, um, and maybe everyone is working on already, but I would just like to underscore is the importance of investing in leadership leadership that represents the founders who you are aiming to serve is so incredibly important because the founders don't see themselves represented 
they may not feel like they belong. They may not feel like it's the community for them. So I would definitely say that one of the most important things is the representation at the top and just really making sure that there is an investment in that leadership because that leadership is going to have a level of lived experience and empathy for those groups that may not be commonplace. And they may know people and have access, right? So the reason why I was able to attract underrepresented founders is because I'm an underrepresented founder, right? And so I also like, I think I wouldn't underestimate the importance of physical diversity. And just when people look at the website, when people look at the programming of really making sure that it feels like this is a place for them, um, I would really underscore. And then like the tenets that we've talked about before, Shav, around community, around really taking the time to interview people, because I'd be curious too, are there certain things that are different about the experience of underrepresented founders in Canada, even versus America? Maybe there are, right? But let's all put on our scientist hat and do some research before diagnosing the problem and trying to write a prescription, right, for the solution. I love that, Mandela. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you for all of the knowledge that you've shared. It's invaluable. Hopefully next year we can do this in person in Ottawa. That would be the wish. So I'm thank ready. you. I'm ready. I got my winter coat ready. Y'all take <laughs> over there this is good because you're coming to ottawa mandela as soon as we're through this pandemic thing i promise you three years of working with you you brought us isa watson in 2019 i don't know if you remember we chatted yeah, and you helped course. us mm -hmm. we were so thrilled and we're so grateful it's been so worth the wait i'm honored to introduce you to my friend and colleague steph reed who is the director of marketing for lspark one of our fellow accelerators here in the ecosystem to say a few words steph over to you Thank you, Sonia, for the warm welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Steph Reed, and it's an absolute honor to be here this afternoon. First and foremost, I want to say a sincere thank you to Shav and to Mandela for your insights. I think we can all agree that we're leaving here today with a lot of things to think about and to learn from. We're proud to be, put, to be part of such an eye-opening discussion. Mandela, thank you for the incredible work you're doing to empower underrepresented founders Working to change the access to investment for these entrepreneurs is truly impactful. We all have so much to learn for you, from you, and thank you for taking the time to share with us today. Although there are so many things that resonated with me today from this afternoon's conversation, including the receipt box, I think one, thing, one piece of advice that stood out to me most was when you spoke about how there are so many nuances that are misunderstood about being an underrepresented founder, and that in order to make a difference, it is important for all of us to take the time to interview and to listen in order to have a strong data set before devising a solution. I know this is something I will take back and apply to the work we are doing at Elspark, and I hope everyone listening today takes the opportunity to apply not only this learning, but all the learnings from today in their own lives. We're grateful to work alongside the team at Invest Ottawa, who continues to spearhead initiatives that truly make a difference in our community. Thank you to Invest Ottawa team for continuing to make space for these important conversations. We're so proud to be a part of this ecosystem. What a way to kick off International Women's Week. Now I will hand the virtual mic back to Sonia. Thank you so much, Steph. And thank you, Mandela, Shav, to everyone who took the time to join us today from far and wide as I was watching the chat box, South Africa, all kinds of parts across the US and Canada. I couldn't be more thrilled. There is so much more to come. International Women's Week is 12 days of integrated programming. There is something for everyone. Our angel breakfast is tomorrow. We have a cyber event on Wednesday and then Elevate International kicks off on Thursday. There's so much. Check us out at investottawa.ca backslash IWW. Big thank you to the team at Invest Ottawa, to Katie LeClaire, to Jess Ward, to our corporate communications team for so much legwork, heart and making this happen. Wishing everyone a great day. Watch for the follow-up communications and recordings. Thank you and stay healthy and safe, everyone.